Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Budget Subcommittee of the Standing Committee on Ways and Means. My name is John Quincy, and I'm chair of this committee. Uh, with me at the dais today are Council Members Warsami, Fry, Goodman, who's ducked in there, Council President Johnson, uh, Council Member uh, Kano, Johnson, Bender, Council Vice President Glidden, Council Member Palomasano, Yang, and Gordon. Uh, colleagues, as you know, this is the first day of our budget markup uh, process. If we're unable to complete our review of the uh, proposed amendments today, we've reserved time for tomorrow, uh, beginning at uh, one uh, tomorrow if needed. The subcommittee has completed all of its hearings on the department uh, budget requests. We've had 27 of them of those meetings over the past uh, couple of months. Uh, so now we're going to take up and consider any amendments to the proposed budget by Merritt Hodges. Uh, before we get started, I'd remind everyone that we're using speaker management. However, as a committee, we won't be uh, confined to the normal processes of a council meeting, so we won't be limited to the uh, speaking time or the number of speeches on any individual item by members. Uh, we're going to proceed a little more informally to the greatest extent possible, but we'll want to keep this on time to see if we can get through our, uh, our order of business. Uh, finance staff is going to be available, uh, and he's here to assist us in the process, as well as department heads who have been notified and are on standby in the event that we may need to revisit any issues for additional details, questions, etc. So with all of that, I'm going to formally move to... Uh, uh, the approval of the mayor's proposed fiscal year 2015 budget. The budget as proposed is before us as a package and is now subject to, to amendments. So we're going to begin that process with a series of amendments uh, that I offer as a, the chair's amendments. The first group are going to be introduced and in, as a group, they're technical amendments. So I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Christensen to be ready for that. And then we're going to introduce a couple of others along the way, and we're going to vote on those um, individually. And then we'll be moving on as a process as further amendments are offered. Um, there's a, a great stack of them that have been pro provided, uh, and those will be kind of our running order of which we'll be uh, recognizing council members to speak to those individual amendments. So let's put the first group of the technical amendments in front of us. Uh, they are typically the bookkeeping corrections, because as you'll recall, this uh, budget was put together over the spring, uh, presented in August, and uh, things have changed along the way, and they need some uh, bookkeeping uh, technical amendment corrections. And so there's a list of series of those. They're uh, identified in your packet there as items 1A through 1I. Um, Ms. Christensen, can you outline those and provide some highlights to those and uh, address any specific questions that council members may have? Uh, Chair Quincy, council members, thank you for the opportunity to uh, run through the technical adjustments to the mayor's 2015 recommended budget. As council member Quincy indicated, the budget is put together early in the fiscal year for the next upcoming budget year. Um, during that time, uh, new information becomes available, particularly as it pertains to um, obligated expenses and revenues. Uh, one example that comes to mind is the provision of information from the Metropolitan Council Environmental Services for the city's uh, sewer fund. Uh, we uh, uh, pay for a significant uh, amount of processing uh, fees to the Met Council. We don't receive that information for the upcoming budget year until September, so that's an item that we would be bringing forward at this time to adjust the budget to more appropriately reflect what our obligations are. Some of the other items that you would see as a technical adjustment include those uh, that are ancillary uh, pieces to recommendations made by the mayor, and by that I mean uh, using 1A as an example that one of the budget requests for 2015 uh, related to a uh, utilization of TIF funds being moved around. The expenditure associated with those TIF funds was not recommended, so the action before you is to merely accommodate the non-use of those funds, to reduce the utilization of those funds. 
In other cases, we have uh, incorporated the allocation of the capital asset request system uh, recommendations. In uh, some areas, particularly public works, we would have put in a, an aggregated amount into the public works department. The action before you today allocates those uh, particular adjustments and recommendations to the individual subdivisions of public works so that when you go to the back of your budget book, there is a schedule that lists out all of the individual recommendations. They would now be accurately reflected throughout the individual departments. Further, there would be other items coming into play, such as adjustments for contractual obligations for the next budget year that were not contemplated in the mayor's recommended budget. You will see that portrayed in item 1H in which the city is in the process of entering into a contract with RSI for operations at the Upper uh, Harbor Terminal, and there is no net impact fiscally to the city other than uh, incoming revenues and outflows. So we're adjusting the budget somewhat administratively, but wanted to make sure that you were aware that we um, are incorporating that action, which I believe is uh, to take place uh, yet uh, into the budget. So those are the type of adjustments that we would be, uh, we are bringing before you today. If there are any particular items that you uh, would like us to explain, we'll be more than happy to do so. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Are there any questions on those uh, items referred to as technical amendments that we'd like additional information on? Not seeing any. I'm going to see if I can uh, go ahead and call for everybody's uh, acceptance of those technical amendments as presented. Staff recommendation. All those in favor of those items, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Those items are carried forward. So thank you for that, Ms. Christensen. I've, I failed to uh, acknowledge who you were. And uh, before we get uh, to the fun of the day, I want to make sure that we're recognizing the uh, strong support that we've all received during this process uh, from our finance department, uh, led in large part by yourself, Ms. Christensen, and uh, of course, Latonia Green, who sits there in the back, which uh, is a comfortable spot for her, but she's been doing all of the back office work that keeps us on schedule. So thank you very much for that. And of course, I have to acknowledge our chief financial officer, Kevin Carpenter, who has uh, assumed the, the chair that you usually occupy during these meetings. So we'll have more on that as we go through the day. Um, the um, the budget that was presented, of course, is a structurally balanced budget. Uh, so anything that we're needing to amend today will require uh, giving up from someplace else. So those are the choices that we're having uh, in front of us and we'll be looking forward to and debating uh, in a fulsome way. The uh, first amendment I'd like to offer as part of the chair's amendment is the consideration of item one. It's a, uh, a motion by myself I we'll catch those at the end of the day. Thank you. Um, motion to incorporate the 2015 mayor's recommended budget, a staff direction for staff and community planning and economic development staff to report to the community development, regulatory services, and the Ways and Means Committees by July 1st of 2015 with the financial status of the Great Streets Facade Improvement and Business District Support Programs for evaluation prior to issuance of the 2015 RFPs. Uh, are there any questions on that particular motion or on uh, we going forward? So that's uh, Council Member Glidden has a question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I really appreciate this um, motion. I think um, from the beginning of the budget period until today, um, there's probably uh, been some confusion and uh, delving into different accounts within CPED to determine our ability to offer the Great Streets program for 2015. And it's a program that I know many businesses I serve um, have been concerned about. And just so we have some clarification, I don't know if this is Ms. Christensen or Mr. Carpenter um, with this motion. My understanding is um, that with the review that has happened, uh, with finance and CPED staff that we do envision that the Great Streets program would be able to be offered as planned for 2015. And if you could clarify what additional assistance we would get from this staff direction in, again, clarifying that uh, we should have funds to complete the Great Streets program as planned for 2015. 
Chair Ms. Quincy, <clears throat> excuse me, Chair Quincy, Council Member Glidden, <clears throat> in reviewing the um, available funding for the Great Streets program and in conversations with uh, uh, staff in CPED, there has been a, <clears throat> pardon me, a reduction in the amount of resources that they anticipated needing in 2015 from the original budget request until this time. Because of the changing nature of the um, uh, allocated dollars and the outstanding contracts, we have worked with CPED to determine that as part of their um, annual aging, uh, appropriation aging report, uh, which is a new activity that was incorporated in the 2014 budget, that they will be monitoring the uh, utilization of uh, contracted dollars to see where they're at uh, by mid-year. We'll be working closely with the Finance and Property Services Department to determine if there uh, is a need for additional appropriation in order to meet the uh, requested RFP funds. The um, In conversation with CPED, it, it was determined that in large part, um, not all of the appropriated funds typically went out in a year, so we will work closely with them to make sure that they have the funds that they need. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Councilmember Gordon, did you take your question out of queue? We're okay? I did. Sorry. I have a, um, a question from Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I Maybe I missed this at the beginning, but um, I noticed no one on my end voted on the very first portion that you had to vote on. So can you explain from the CD members and the council president who are sitting in your committee what our role is, where we can speak up, where we cannot? Because I just noticed not one person over here voted. Um, there were questions. No one's been called on. Uh, is I, this packet the order in which you're bringing everything forward, and that's hard and fast? So the chair's already decided what the order is, so people are not allowed to bring up their motions in advance of what you have now dictatorially decided what the order is? The, uh, the opportunity is for all members, of course, to have a conversation and uh, to vote. Uh, this is the, the subcommittee of the budget committee. So everybody has that opportunity and uh, feel free to jump in line. The uh, order that I had proposed is the way we were navigating the uh, submitted uh, amendments that was proposed to um, finance staff. So I, I did absolutely put them in an order that I thought was uh, appropriate uh, to dealing with individual questions. If somebody had a specific item that they'd like to bring up out of that order, I'm happy to entertain that idea, but I would like to proceed with the, this order unless there's some driven reason that we would like to move off of that. So in terms of the rest of us commenting, voting, et cetera, you're treating it as a large committee of the whole? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Council President Johnson. Uh, so Mr. Chair, back to the um, technical amendments that, so the first motion here was to vote on these technical amendments, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, can I go back then and ask a question about uh, 1F, please? I'd be happy to entertain that question. Ms. Christensen, right. 1F relates to public works. Uh, which, uh, okay, how did we reduce the expense um, by $2 million for organics rollout? Chair Quincy, uh, Council Member, um, Council President Johnson, uh, in the original recommended budget, the uh, budget proposal as put forth by Public Works incorporated funding for uh, the full year rollout of organics as well as uh, anticipating some additional costs associated with a future uh, construction of a, of a solid waste facility, uh, which resulted in a fee structure that was ultimately not recommended. Therefore, because the fee structure was not recommended at the level at which it was originally brought forward, the expenses are reduced, uh, particularly as they pertain to uh, anticipated costs of the new facility. Uh, and what that means is we're really reducing the budget so it just reflects the organics and not necessarily any ancillary costs. The new, the new facility. Not reflecting the cost of a new facility? Is that? Future cost of a new facility. Okay. Um, then, uh, all right, uh, then I guess my, uh, the next question, Mr. Chair, do you mind? No, please. Uh, on one I, um, the Nicollet Mall reconstruction, can you explain that to me? Yes, uh, Chair Quincy, Council President Johnson, one I is a mechanism in which we are able to reallocate uh, unused leftover money from existing um, 
capital projects. Because we adopt and approve capital projects on an individual basis, in order to reallocate unused funds, we have to go through a mechanism seeking approval to essentially use the leftover for another purpose. So the action before you is to utilize unneeded resources from completed projects to direct it towards the city's uh, match for the Nicollet Mall project of $3.5 million. So they would be like closed out projects yes. that have an existing balance? Yes. Okay. Uh, then Mr. Chair, one more thing, sorry. On 1H, um, please, um, Ms. Christensen, explain that to me, the, the Upper Harbor uh, increasing the revenue and expense. Chair Quincy Council President Johnson, in the mayor's recommended budget, uh, in anticipation of the impending closure of the uh, Upper Harbor Terminal, the recommended budget did not incorporate uh, the full annual operating expenses typically associated with the Upper Harbor Terminal, which is basically the agreement with RSI to operate the terminal. Uh, knowing that the um, final closure is unlikely to occur, particularly early in the year, CPED staff felt prudent to enter into a contract with uh, RSI to maintain the operations at the terminal to at least gain some use out of it in the interim. Uh, and because that was not included in the mayor's recommended budget, it's really an adjustment to reflect the revenues and expenses associated with that operating contract. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, th thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, back to Nicollet Mall then. Uh, so if we have if we found existing resources for the Nicollet Mall construction, reconstruction project, does that free up dollars uh, available in the capital program then? Uh, Chair Quincy, Council President Johnson, it, it does not. Uh, those were uh, resources that were pre-allocated to projects that have now been completed. They, uh, there would possibly be an opportunity if there was an additional uh, need within capital to reallocate. Uh, that would also provide for um, a deficit in the amount of required match for the Nicollet Mall project. So maybe I'll talk to you offline. I just need to understand. So we, we haven't, we don't have capacity then in the existing capital program, even though we, or excuse me, as proposed, the existing capital program as proposed because we've paid for the Nicollet Mall um, reconstruction out of existing resources. It doesn't free anything up in the capital program then? Council President Johnson, that's correct. Normally when these projects have been um, completed yep. and if we have not issued the bonds, the authority is either used to supplement shortfalls in other projects or the authorization expires. Uh, so we're utilizing our ability to uh, bond, borrow money, left over from other projects to give us the opportunity to uh, provide our portion of the Nicollet Mall project. But I guess then, then I'm not understanding because the mayor has proposed a capital budget that includes $3.5 million for our part of the Nicollet Mall project, right? Correct. Okay, we're getting that three and a half million dollars from existing resources that have been budgeted in years prior for other projects. Why doesn't that free up three and a half million dollars in the mayor's proposed capital budget? Chair Quincy, Council President Johnson, the uh, reallocated funds before you on the technical adjustment are the same dollars as indicated in the mayor's recommended budget. The recommended budget anticipated the availability of project funds available at the end of 2014 based upon projections and knowledge of the current status of various projects. So we basically okay. kind of kind of hoped that we would end up with this Got available. It. All right, I understand. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Council Member Cano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to go back a little bit to the conversation uh, Councilmember Goodman had started. So two questions. I have an amendment that didn't make it into the list uh, because I was making last changes. I'm sorry, a motion. I was making last changes. Um, so we have a copy that uh, the city clerk's staff members should have. I'm just curious as to when that gets passed out and how to get incorporated into the package. I'm, I'm going to ask some help from the city clerk to make sure that that it is one of the 
uh, adjustments of the one of the previous submitted motions. Is that correct, Council Member? Yes. So it's like the number three of your yes. set on immigration. So we'll just make sure that that's replaced and talked to at the at the time of the when we're going to be talking about those. Right, because currently it's not in the pile. It's There's only the pile. two. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to leave that to uh, the city clerk and uh, my aide, Mr. Mr. Dibvig, if he can assist in that okay, process thank you. to make sure that we're addressing it in the in the appropriate order. Thank you. Councilmember Palomasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm noticing in this budget markup that when I previously brought this to you, I have a rather complicated motion and you had said I could go um, first or near the beginning. Um, and I would like to request that I could move that up in the order. It's currently number 20, um, and I'd be willing to entertain moving it after deference to you, the chair, and the council president, and the council vice president, but I would like it a lot further up in the um, in the consideration process, okay. if you would. I would. So perhaps number five and a half? Five and a half, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll be able to uh, accommodate that request. It is a uh, uh, complicated, and it could could be first or it could be last, but we'll see how it goes. Um, let's see, so that's addressing that. Were there any questions on the, the motion in, in front of us, actually, which is the uh, one of mine, which one is that? The Great Streets facade uh, staff direction. Thank you. Not seeing any. If I could call for a vote on that particular item, all those in favor on that staff direction, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that item carries. Uh, my second um, chair's uh, amendment uh, is uh, identified as number two in your packet. It's a motion to amend the recommended budget to utilize $80,000 in anticipated savings from the reduction of the citywide health insurance premium and increase the 2000 recommended, uh, 15 recommended budget in the city clerk for a full-time uh, position. Any questions on that particular motion? Not seeing any. Oh, I'm sorry. Council President Johnson. I'm trying to find my speaker management thing here. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Mr. Chair, I guess I would ask um, what, uh, what kind of a position that is in the city clerk's uh, budget? That would be a uh, city clerk uh, coordinator position. Uh, co uh, committee coordinator. That's correct. The current position, as I understand it, is uh, funded on a uh, contract basis and a temporary employee. This just moves it to a full-time employee uh, as part of the represented organization. Um, I think uh, we should ask um, Mr. Chair uh, Finance to uh, Ms. Christensen to talk about the health care savings um, and what uh, what the dollars are available uh, uh, from that savings um, so that we understand the um, implication of the motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Frequency, uh, Council President Johnson, uh, as you're aware, we uh, received a favorable um, renewal quote from Medica for 2015. Uh, we had built um, no increase into the city's 2015 budget, and we were um, delighted to have Medica come in with a 3% reduction in the overall uh, premium for health insurance for 2015. Uh, we have, uh, in looking at um, the potential changes caused by the Affordable Care Act, as well as uh, uncertainty as to the uh, any shifts in coverage resulting from open enrollment, we have identified approximately $200,000 as um, pretty safe amount of savings that we might be able to garner from the reduction in the health insurance. Um, again, dependent upon uh, the results of the uh, open enrollment and so on. Uh, under other circumstances, these funds would um, supplement the city's fund balance uh, and uh, provide for funding opportunities in the future. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. So uh, would you say 200000 is a pretty conservative estimate then? 
I think that's the number that we're comfortable with without uh, pushing the envelope, not knowing what's coming through with um, uh, the Affordable Care Act and changes in the uh, coverages. And when will we have the final information about um, uh, what coverage people have chosen? And what's our, what's our total premium for uh, health care? Council <clears throat> President Johnson, you have me at a loss. I don't know that number. I'd be happy to find it okay. and provide it. Uh, my helpful. sense is that we will know uh, toward the end of December prior to uh, having the um, premium payment invoicing that we uh, paid to Medica for the January coverage. Okay, can you get me that number then sure. about what our total costs are sure. last year versus what we're projecting for this year or for next year for health care? Thank you. Uh, Council Member Glidden. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, like others, this is the first time I've seen this motion. And um, I appreciate the questions from Council President Johnson. I, I have to say, um, and there's a, where's Ms. Christensen? She's over there. Um, I just have some overall concerns about um, our ability to maintain proper flexibility in dealing with kind of a, a range of um, enterprise employee type issues. Um, I can probably name off three things in my head uh, that I know are coming forward this year that either have to do with contract negotiations. We need to deal with expected and unexpected issues involving some major contract negotiations. Um, with the uh, benefits uh, that may uh, be proposed um, with other adjustments that uh, may need to be made. Um, and so I guess my question back to you is, um, what should we be thinking of in terms of ensuring that we have the proper flexibility to deal with these issues, which um, really are about, again, really uh, thinking of the needs of the employees within the enterprise and being able to meet them as issues come up. Uh, Chair Quincy, Council Member Glidden, that's a very uh, important point to keep in mind as we um, look at adjusting the 2015 budget because we know that there are things that will come down the pipeline that uh, we may not even be aware of now, much less for items that we know that we're going to be addressing in 2015 uh, that may have a financial consequence. At the same time, uh, the city does rely on a certain amount of ongoing budgetary savings to provide us with that flexibility, which allows us to offset uses of fund balance in uh, the short term, providing for things like the CARS program and uh, the ability to use fund balance for some of these one-time funded items that are in the recommended budget before you today. So to your point, yes, there is, um, there's a little flexibility all over the place. We know that uh, most everybody comes in a little under their budget and we bring in a little more revenue than uh, typically what we think we might because we're, um, you know, the economy is great. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it is kind of a, um, a tough decision to make whether or not uh, to uh, tie up potential flexibility uh, during the year for uh, inaction now. Thank you. Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd want to know, yeah, there, there is the ability to supplement the fund balance or save the money. There's the ability to use it for future spending. There's also the ability to not increase the levy as much. So is there a penny left on the table anyone's not willing to spend? I mean, here we have a savings that we're getting, and Councilmember Palansamo has a motion to make that savings actual savings to taxpayers, and that's what I think we should do. And I will note that uh, Councilmember Palansamo's motion directly targets, targets this money for a uh, levy decrease three motions from now. So I don't think that we need to be worrying when we're sitting on a good amount of money in our general account when we know that taxes probably will be greater than what we've projected and that savings from departments will generally be lower than projected. I don't think we have to worry about this $200,000 being the difference between uh, defaulting on a check or not. Thank you. Other questions on this item? Okay, I'm not seeing any uh, on, this, uh, on this motion. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Roll call. 
Ms. Hansen. We wonder if we could have a roll call vote, please. Council Member Glidden. Aye. Yang. Aye. Bender. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Nay. Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fry. Nay. President Johnson. Nay. Warsami. Nay. Goodman. No. Kano. Aye. Chair Quincy. Aye. There are eight ayes and five nays. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to um, go to the, the third motion, which is uh, by uh, Council President Johnson. So if Council President Johnson, if you could briefly introduce or, or speak to your uh, item number three on our packet list. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this is a motion um, to uh, increase the appropriation, expense appropriation and staffing in the city clerk's department by $100,000 and one FTE for the purposes of managing data practices requests on an ongoing basis. And those costs would be recouped through the city's internal cost allocation mechanism. So in other words, those, the dollars, the $100,000 would be allocated to the individual departments. In, in my opinion, um, we need to have uh, a central uh, entrance po point for all data practices requests, um, which are increasing every single year. Um, this person would be responsible for ensuring that the individual departments who would provide the data practices request do so on a timely basis and would be the central mechanism for um, the ongoing reporting and then, and then um, what would you call it, a reporting plus uh, keeping track of um, these uh, data practices requests. And seeing as how uh, there are individual departments that spend a lot of time on data practices requests. So the police department has people embedded in the department that work on data practices requests because they get a lot of them. Um, the city attorney's office also um, has people that work on data practices requests because the, you know, we also always have to be concerned about the legal aspects and making sure that the information that's shared is, is uh, public information, that sort of thing. Um, the communications department is involved in uh, data practices requests, as we all know. Um, but this person would be the person, the entry point, uh, and then would develop the mechanism and systems to make sure that those requests are handled on a timely manner and uh, comply with state law regarding data practices requests. So because it's an overall enterprise um, function, uh, it seemed to me that coming out of the internal service fund that is charged to individual departments makes sense. Thank you very much for those comments. Are there additional comments, questions? I'd uh, like to uh, uh, recognize, of course, Council Vice President Glidden first, and then I'll have a follow-up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I wanted to thank uh, Council President Johnson for this um, motion on what is clearly a um, needed position performing statutorily required duties, um, and I'm going to support this uh, motion today. I did want to just note, though, for uh, departments that are um, uh, listening um, my concern moving forward is we have added several positions throughout the enterprise this year that are to assist in performing, again, these statutorily required duties of uh, data practices, responses, and managing data. Um, my concern is that these um, positions um, are working together and also that we have a good uh, team that is working on how we have an enterprise-wide response and procedure and protocol that is recognized throughout our enterprise, that we are responsive, that we um, uh, uh, don't have things that kind of get down into the cracks and uh, get into our silos. So that's what I will be looking for as this year moves forward and um, hope to connect with departments on understanding how that goal is being accomplished. I, I think that would be appropriate, and I don't know if we need to formally adopt it as a footnote, but certainly something we'll be watching for and looking forward to in, in future Committee of the Whole meetings uh, and other council meetings. Um, uh, council Member Glidden, and then so, yes, I'd like to again say thank you again for, to Council President Johnson for bringing this forward. <coughs> I believe it's an important uh, step forward as an enterprise view of how we're handling data practices requests. 
and for the clerk's office uh, to be the um, recipient of that uh, staff work to help coordinate uh, all the departments working together on that issue. It is an enterprise-wide issue. So all those in favor of this uh, particular item, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? That item carries. Thank you very much. I think we'll go to the next uh, staff direction noted as number four in our packet uh, by v Vice President Glidden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a pretty short one. This relates to the um, funding recommended as part of the city coordinator's budget for downtown events. And this is a staff direction uh, for the city coordinator to include staff from multiple departments, including CPED, to solicit, evaluate, and recommend proposals for downtown activation activities that align with city goals and complement city initiatives. I will just note that um, we did have a, a meeting that included some representatives from across the city, including the city coordinator himself and someone from the mayor's office. I have also discussed this with the downtown council. Um, I think we need to just ensure that we are um, uh, utilizing the input from uh, multiple departments that touch economic development activities and thinking about our downtown activation in the long term for that. Thank you. Any Questions on that motion by Council Vice President Glidden? I'd like to say that I, I believe it demonstrates a clear partnership with the Downtown Council, and it really incorporates, um, as we're going forward, making sure that uh, Minneapolis is well represented, especially in the economic development uh, area, as this is uh, something that's important to the downtown activation year round. Uh, so all those in favor of that staff direction, please say aye. Aye. Opposed. That item carries. The uh, next staff direction is a motion by Council President uh, Johnson. Um, Council President Johnson, would you care to speak to this motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, after having uh, extensive conversations with my colleagues, as well as um, finance, um, and as well as uh, with the fire chief, um, I'm gonna make a motion and then speak to it. Um, it's a staff direction um, to the, the 2015 mayor's recommended budget to direct the fire department to commence with recruit, recruit classes, which she has funded two of in this budget, uh, as quickly as possible, as soon as feasible, and report back to the Ways and Means Committee with a plan to maintain staffing at the approved complement <coughs> by July 1st, 2015, for the purpose of reviewing and recommending mechanisms to provide for enhanced staffing levels. And my sense is um, the chief has, um, uh, and his finance officer have talked about some of the challenges that they have within their existing budget. Um, they are, uh, right now, because they are not fully staffed up to the budgeted level that they have, um, they are incurring um, extensive overtime costs we also are seeing our firefighters because the force is older. Um, I hate to gray hair. <laughs> uh, uh, we are seeing uh, very uh, uh, distinct uh, increases in the work, workman's comp costs uh, with nearly a doubling over the last uh, several years of workman's comp uh, costs. And so it is. it seems to me that it's incumbent on us that we um, uh, get ourselves up with these two recruit classes to the existing uh, budget authority. The chief, I sh should also say the chief has underspent his budget. So at the end of this year, he's going to be turning money back to the city. That's crazy. We want our money spent on firefighters. That's why we budget for uh, what we do. So uh, this will allow him to quickly get two classes going and then a re with a report to the Ways and Means Committee for uh, in July to uh, talk to us and make the case for enhanced staffing for the fire department. So that's what this motion does. Thank you, uh, Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much. I'm very supportive of this. I think this is a good approach. Uh, I also um, will be very interested in April looking at exactly what is the, uh, the rollover. And I think let's pay attention to those dollars because potentially those might be able to be used for uh, uh, Firefighters. I think one of the things we might find is the way the budget works is that um, by July, because we haven't been able to ha get up to the number, 406, I think it is, we'll actually have money waiting there so we could even um, try to get above 406 by the end of the year. Um, the one thought I had when I read this um, staff direction was, um, however, um, 
why wouldn't this also, or why wouldn't this be going to the Public Safety Committee? But I think we can take that up later if this passes in the year and get the report there as well, because I think this is something that the Public Safety Committee is really concerned about and will be wanna, wanna be following carefully. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Andrew Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm encouraged by the ongoing and one-time uh, allocations or additional increases that the mayor has in the budget. I was uh, happy to see the focus on how we can get around this issue where we're constantly hiring up and then seeing attrition, hiring up then seeing attrition, because as uh, Council President Johnson said, we do have this aging workforce. They're doing more work with less personnel. And as a result, we're seeing a greater increase of injuries and overtime and workers' comp. And uh, so I'm encouraged by uh, the prospect that we can get above this 406 number, higher up beyond that, and then uh, hedge against attrition with some of these ongoing dollars and work to make sure that we have our uh, forces adequately staffed out there who are looking out for all of our residents. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any additional questions, comments? Obviously, I'm, I'm very supportive of this, uh, this staff direction, and uh, I think it is a good way. I'd like to point out, as Council President pointed out, there is significant uh, cost savings in the budget uh, this year from the fire department, and that's largely due to the fact that they uh, underspent their budgeted complement of firefighters, and that provided a, enough resources at the end that we'll be able to maintain the uh, training and hiring process to get more uh, firefighters uh, ready to take uh, the seats in the rigs, as well as uh, prepay uh, some of their capital expenditures, including uh, breathing apparatuses for the in entire uh, uh, force. So thank you for that work and for everybody's uh, support of this particular motion. Uh, Councilmember Yang. Oh, I'm sorry, that was Councilmember Reich that had his tag up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm <coughs> currently not in speaker management, so I have to do this red placard, but um, I, I, I as well as supportive of this. And I think this is really a beginning of a conversation about our long-term commitments to hiring and staffing, and not just for our immediate needs, but for the long-term needs. One of the challenges that the chief and the department have is that we have this sort of looming, we don't know how many returns we could have at any given year, and with a, a large pool of potential, that's a lot of risk to manage at any given time. And so hopefully what we're doing now sets up something I'm, I hope we're committed to, particularly uh, around uh, the mid, by coming back next year in the middle of the year to talk about what we can do ongoing that talks about the peaks and valleys so we don't have these challenges in the future. So uh, I think it's, for me, this is about future conversations as much as this year's budget. Thank you for that. All those in favor of this staff direction, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, that item carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, now I guess we're gonna go to uh, item 5.5. This is Council Member Palomasano's um, rather complex, lots of moving parts uh, motion. Some of you are seeing this for the first time, so I expect a lot of questions and, and discussion on this particular item. It's noted as item 20 in your packet. Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I wanted to bring this a little bit further up so that we could have some healthy discussion about it because it might impact future motions. Um, this is a complex motion. And this is about me looking very carefully um, at the ways that we've proposed to grow our city enterprise with the levy. Through this, I've sought to do a few things and I wanted to explain that. First and foremost, it was to step very gently, um, to not impact people's visions with um, things that they wanted to do, uh, new, new departments that they felt needed to be created within the city. Um, it was also to preserve the mayor's vision, um, but it was to really focus in on core city services and to be an excellent steward of our tax money. Um, the biggest thing that I've heard from our taxpayers across the city, not just in my own ward, is the full amount of property taxes can be unwieldy. Um, in my own area in Southwest Minneapolis, we have some rapidly increasing property values, which is, which is great, except when you, it really impacts so many people's ability to stay in their homes over time, that has an exponential effect on property taxes. Um, I, I feel strongly about this motion from a competitive competitiveness standpoint, and I think that's important, especially on the edges. I can't tell you how many people um, 
have, have literally moved across the street from me um, because of how many more, less property taxes they will pay moving just across our boundaries. And I wanna keep them in. Uh, so if you would let me to allow me to step through these piece by piece and give you some of my rationale before questions. Um, this motion is to amend the 2015 budget to reduce the property tax levy increase from 2.4% to 2%. And it would go through these eight steps and there's one change to the eighth. Um, part A, to take that civil rights disparity study that's a two year study in the civil rights office mm -hmm. and parse that expense across the two years of the study. So that would be a $150,000 decrease um, it would be half this year and half next year. That's when the work will be done. Um, the second piece is reducing the 50% of one-time funding for the Clean Energy Initiative down to half of its original proposal. Um, I think that, that that work is important. That was certainly an element of, I mean, that's one of the values that we stand for for the city. I do think that that, after some careful conversations and deliberation, could be assumed in its full intent by the mayor's sustainability staff, by the sustainability office that sits within the coordinator's purview, and also this allocation. Um, part C is a reduction in the one-time funding in the convention center from $500,000 into $400,000. That is entirely in marketing expense costs. Part D is eliminating the TIF activities in the NCR department, there were three ads proposed to that department for this year. The first is one that I'm not changing, it's the ADA accessibility study. Um, I, I agree we need to do that study and that that's critical to what we do here as a city. Um, but the increase to the neighborhood, an additional neighborhood support specialist um, and proposing that we cut as well as an increase in the additional allocation to the one Minneapolis fund. Um, that would then utilize, we would then utilize $300,000 of TIF to replace general fund resources in NCR. NCR is not fully funded from TIF. It's about half um, general fund money. Part E is to use that reduction in the health insurance um, projected funds. And this was a very, very conservative estimate that I received from the department that handles that, Joyce Traver, by $200,000 to reflect the lower premium that we were promised after many discussions this past July from a conversation about whether we do self-insured or fully insured as a plan. Um, this estimate is, is quite conservative, is quite low, um, and I'm not sure how this might impact your motion to Mr. Chair. Um, part G, or sorry, part F. This is also an, a reduction in the two FTEs plus some additional funding for the Office of Equitable Outcomes to half of its original proposal. This still preserves staff in that new office and I, and I do believe that it still helps to get that work started in appropriate ways as we look for additional grant money from the federal government and look to do more with it next year. The last piece is something I'd like to amend. Currently it talks about keeping the full funding for the pedestrian safety initiatives, but funding it slightly differently. And instead, I would like to retract that part H and instead insert a reduction to the cars that's an ongoing expense from 8.2 million down to 8.0. So that's where that money would come from instead. 200 instead of 250? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just told I would, I, I, I was, I missed, I skipped over one. Um, the other reduction is that part G. It's a reduction in ongoing funding from the homeownership counseling and outreach by $125,000 and in shifting an additional 75 of it into one-time funding. So that is a reduction in the proposed $375,000 into that um, fund by $125,000. That fund originally has existing money for it. It is an outreach program. It is not a direct, a, a direct assist program. Um, it does have, I believe, enough current funding for it to get started with its work, and I'm hoping that it spends it because my understanding is that it has not spent it for the past two years. So it would be an increase to this amount, but not 
um, a huge increase to this particular budget item. So those are the pieces that I'm proposing. Well, I'm sure there's gonna be a number of conversations about this. I think we may, Ms. Christensen, you're raising your finger. Do you have an, I wonder if we could, in addition to the individual line item requests or changes proposed, uh, could you talk to the implication of a ongoing versus one time and how that would affect the levy per se? Uh, specifically why I'm standing is um, with the recommended change of the shift uh, from public works to CARS funding uh, will not accomplish the same thing because CARS funding is fund balance or one-time funding. So that would be um, one item for consideration that you, you, we would have to look at doing differently. Um, we, in order to have the levy savings um, to equate to the item that's currently on the list, it would need to be an ongoing funded item. So then, if I may, um, Ms. Christensen, the, what I see on this um, slide that says general fund enhancements ongoing, the line item that says funding for year one of the 2015 to 2019 program that isn't an ongoing expense, it, it really then is just for next year. The uh, funding that is provided for ongoing related to cars are for the operational expenses that are associated with um, the purchase of new software or for maintenance associated with additional vehicles. So it's, um, if, if one were to reduce that ongoing funding, uh, there would be a need also to not buy the capital that is requiring the um, money to uh, pay for the maintenance. Okay, then um, I think for now, and I'll let my colleagues potentially amend this, but I will, I'll just remove that last line item. Uh, Councilmember, Vice President Glidden. Uh, did I miss that? I'm sorry. Councilmember Gordon. Thank you. Um, well, I've got a lot of concerns about the variety of these cuts. It looks like other of the cuts are one-time funding cuts as well, so I'm not sure what that would actually do. But I was just wondering if you had a uh, written version you could send us of the latest, because it sounds like H is now gone that had to do with the funding for pedestrian safety initiatives. Um, and maybe that's the only change now, so no, so it's no longer, because, um, so, so that will change the amount and the, to the reduce it by $250,000. So is there a, a new, um, can we get a written version of the latest one, I guess was my question. So then, Mr. Chair, Council Member Gordon, it is just removing H, that's all it is. Does that affect What would you um, consider then removing A, B, um, D as well? If, if that's what you want to propose in an amendment, but I'm not proposing that at this time. Council Member, Vice President Glidden. Thanks, um, Mr. Chair, and I will have a few questions um, about this. The first is, so I understand that one piece of ongoing funding <coughs> has been removed, and I'd like to get some, um, then a uh, recalculation of what is the impact then of the changes. So I realize that may take a, a little bit of time, maybe not that long to produce, but I'd like to understand then what is the proposed levy uh, decrease, I guess, once that piece is removed, and then what would be the average reduction in city property taxes so we can just kind of bring that down to kind of an everyday um, understanding. So that's one question. Um, my second question, um, and I'm, I'm happy if um, Councilmember Palmisano, I don't know if you, you want to um, comment on this, or I probably would also want Ms. Christensen to comment, is um, what is the impact, <coughs> if any, on the property tax um, or the, the levy impact of these one-time reductions, one-time funding reductions? So we have um, A, B, C and, is it just A, B, C, excuse me. A, B, and C, those are all one-time initiatives um, or one-time funding pieces. What would be the impact on the property tax levy of um, eliminating that funding? 
Uh, Chair Quincy, yes. Councilmember Glidden, um, Councilmember Palmasano all tried to articulate, um, as I know that we'd worked to, uh, together on this. Um, if I misspeak, please jump in. Uh, the uh, rationale, I believe, behind the elimination or the reduction of the uh, one-time funded items, um, absolutely they don't have a one-to-one -one correlation or impact on the levy because one-time one items are funded through the city's fund balance, uh, not property tax levy. With the uh, rec or proposals incorporated in this motion, the uh, Three items that are recommended for reduction from one-time funding frees up fund balance, which then is being utilized to pay for several currently levy-funded items. So the um, so we're taking. I kind of got lost in that. Circle. Okay, yeah. let me. So yeah. I, I would like the specifics of what is it replaced okay. or whatever that. There is. Uh, I just need this broken down. It is complicated. Yep. That's, I'll walk through it, just not a problem. The, um, okay, so the three items that are on the top of the list include a reduction in one-time funding for the civil rights disparity study. So that was uh, a recommendation for $300,000 that was supposed to come out of fund balance. The proposal reduces that by 150. So we now have $150,000 of fund balance available for some other purpose. Okay, but does it have an impact on the levy? This does not. Any, okay, any and then what about the, the other two then? they Because I know there's some shifting, and so I just want to understand, do those items right. also have an impact on the levy? Uh, neither of those two items have a uh, direct le uh, levy impact. Okay, okay. Um, my next question um, is um, on the... The NCR department, this is probably one of the more confusing pieces, um, but I just, and, and I think it just, um, I think I know the answer here, but um, I think it bears just asking. Um, by putting these additional positions that are today, well, actually, so, so there's 150,000 from NCR activities, is that intended to refer to a position or some other um, item within NCR? That may be a question to Council Member Palmisano. So how is, how is the NCR money broken down? So I see item D says NCR activities, and my question on that one was, is that referring to a specific positions or is it some other type of activities? Um, that is... That is the number out. The, that is the amount, the departmental increase that is allocated to the what they are calling one additional neighborhood support specialist, where that uh, position would both be in addition to their existing neighborhood support specialist staff, and in addition to do some compliance work with neighborhood organizations across the city. Um, and my intent on this was to be able to use our new revamped internal audit office for some of that auditing work and some of that auditing effort, but not to increase the neighborhood support specialist positions um, at this time. Okay, so, so, so your thought was that was about these new proposed positions, although I will say I thought those were already funded out of the TIF, so maybe it's just 150, however it may be today in general fund, you're proposing to move that then to to take a tip. out the general fund amount for it and use TIF instead to backfill it. Okay, and, and maybe this is why I'm a little bit confused is because I thought these two items were already TIF funded, and so to move more things from general fund to TIF fund, um, my understanding would be you'd need to kind of go deeper into the department. Um, I think that was kind of a little bit of the controversy on the mayor's proposal was it was these items, new items were proposed to be funded through the TIF as opposed to new activities funded from the general fund. Ms. Christensen, could you yeah, clarify? Chair, Chair Quincy, Council Member Glidden, the uh, two items uh, under letter D, NCR activities in one Minneapolis, each for $150,000, were new TIF funded activities 
incorporated into the mayor's recommendation. The, um, I believe that the proposal here is to not do the new things, oh, okay. take the TIF money and swap it out for general fund. Maybe that's how I got confused. So this would just be eliminating those activities and then um, looking for a place in NCR where today there's general fund funded stuff and then um, replacing that mm -hmm. with TIF. And I guess then my follow-up question, and this is where I think, I, that I didn't know the answer to that, but I thank you for straightening me out. But on this then, um, I guess the, the outstanding question um, uh, would be, are we confident that there is sufficient funding then within the TIF to have the CPP or whatever or other kind of more uh, programmed um, activities funded at their existing levels? Chair Quincy, Council Member Glidden, the, uh, the appropriation in the rec recommendation for CPP and the allocation to uh, neighborhood programs and other activities would not be impacted by this move. Uh, there would be um, certainly potentially impact in the future as a result of relying more greatly on TIF if there were to be uh, for some reason a decline or the sunsetting of the TIF district um, or a desire to use the TIF money for something else. So uh, we're just uh, shifting reliance for NCR operations from general fund onto TIF. Okay. Um, and, and my thinking was that there would be sufficient funds within there to, to cover that, but I think it's worth understanding is that so? Um, let's see here. I think we've already talked some about health insurance. Um, Let me talk more, a little bit more about the health insurance. We're talking about the 200,000 um, that we feel conservative and con confident of that will be available. Um, that's really, again, a kind of a one-time thing, isn't it? Or is it based on the levy? Uh, the health insurance is currently contemplated to be paid uh, in large part out of the levy for any general fund employee, their health insurance is funded from levy. In fact, we've just reduced that amount by 80,000. Does that change the number available and what impact that would be? On that this would reduce the number available to 120. Okay. I'm gonna ask one more question then I might get myself back in queue. I know that there's a, a line up here. Um, I guess the other question I would ask was about the clean energy initiative. And so I'm trying to keep this more to questions as opposed to getting into um, a whole lot of um, discussion about, about this. But um, with the clean energy initiative, I guess my question there was whether Council Member Palmisano had discussed what would be the impact of reducing this by $75,000 with um, either the mayor's office or the um, sustainability office. Um, I know that I have been uh, pretty versed in uh, what is anticipated uh, with the Clean Energy Initiative. Um, I'll just note for other council members, you know, this was clearly um, something that was proposed and sort of an outcome of um, our um, <coughs> agreement with Excel Energy and CenterPoint um, uh, to have this um, brand new partnership. Um, the idea behind the partnership is in part uh, a staffing, but it also is about program implementation. I mean, the Clean Energy Partnership isn't about meeting. Um, the Clean Energy Partnership is about program identification and then rolling out those programs and hoping to um, uh, get, get a worthwhile benefit to our residents. And one of the, I think, top things on the list is looking at multi-unit uh, residential um, uh, programming. So 
So there is that. I, I think maybe just as a point of order, I, it would make me extremely uncomfortable to have the mayor staff person um, leading this, mainly just because it's, it, you know, that's her political staff person. Um, it's just like asking, you know, Councilmember Quin Quincy's aide to to lead to lead that 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 person responds to um, Councilmember Quincy, um, as opposed to having a, a staff member that um, is part of the General City Enterprise. <coughs> So, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, just to briefly respond um, to your concerns. I, first of all, I need to say I deeply appreciate all of the work of yourself and Councilmember Gordon in bringing all of this to the clean energy partnership that it is. Um, I have communicated this intent with the coordinator's office, but I have not yet had a conversation with the coordinator himself. Um, but while I do appreciate that the mayor's staff should all be the mayor's political staff. I do think that the success of the Clean Energy Partnership is deeply dependent on the heavy involvement by leadership themselves. And so um, that is with the mayor herself and, and what I think is, is you, Council Vice President and Council Member Gordon's continued involvement in all of this work. Um, the Office of Sustainability, from my understanding, and you might have a different knowledge than I do on it, um, assisted a lot with these discussions about Minneapolis energy options and the Clean Energy Partnership, as did um, Ms. Z Zawistowski uh, from the mayor's office, and her continued involvement in it, I think, is, is a big element of its success. So I, just to offer that. Thanks. Uh, Council Member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I, I just want to commend Council Member Palansamo. Uh, it is very difficult after being here only 10 or 12 months, 10 or 11 months, to actually come up with a legitimate and arguable <coughs> list of reductions. I will note for Council Member Gordon, this is not a cut. None of this money even exists in any of these pots right now. This is a, a, a decrease of the increase or a decrease of a proposed allocation. None of these things are things that we um, had funded for the past 20 years that all of a sudden we're not going to fund and so all of a sudden it's a cut. It, it is spending less on items that have been suggested by the mayor's office and the finance department office. And this council has the opportunity to put our stamp on this budget. And to think that we're not going to do it is ridiculous. Councilmember Palansamo made an effort to stand up for what she believes in, which I also believe in, which is every penny on the table does not need to be spent on something. And the, and the levy cumulatively is difficult for a lot of people to handle. And unfortunately, it hurts people who pay less more because their percentage is higher. So higher income people actually are less impacted by this because it's a percentage of their income and their budget. Property taxes are harder on people who pay less because the percentage is higher. So I commend you for the work that you've done. I support your motion. I think some of these things are little things that can be worked out. Uh, I appreciate the change in item H. I'm not sure that we can't find something to replace item H. Certainly we're not gonna replace it with money from Public Works. There's been some conversation with the chair about that and I support the chair's point of view on that. Um, but also Ultimately, all of the money is the same other than the enterprise funds. <laughs> so whether it's one time or levy induced, it's money sitting in a big pot and we can determine what, how it's going to be spent. Mm -hmm. I'll notice, note, many of the people on this panel have amendments coming right after this that shoot at these exact same things and just spend it on something different. So these are not sacred cows and we can show a little restraint here and spend a little bit less than what's been suggested um, without uh, criticizing any kind of council member for not going along with what finance or the mayor's office wants. Council President Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I, I just wanna echo uh, Council Member Goodman's uh, remarks and point out that all of the revenues, whether it's tax increment, whether it's one time, whether it's levy, uh, whether it's fund balance, those are all taxpayer dollars. They don't come out of the air. And so reductions like this to enhancements, enhancements are the place that we actually have some wiggle room in the budget to do things differently. And some people are proposing to spend those dollars. Some people are proposing not to spend the dollars. But the, but the critical point is that they're all taxpayer dollars. And um, to, to try to define this as one time, this is uh, ongoing, the levy is a number. If we don't levy that much, it gives us that l much less to spend and we can figure out the details later. 
Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I I actually am really appreciative as well as, as um, people have said about the attempt to demonstrate fiscal responsibility and to be good stewards of tax dollars. Um, much of this I don't support because really what this is is taking from people who need our support and investment the most. This year in Minneapolis, about half of our residents will actually see a property tax decrease. And that's because their neighborhoods have been disinvested for years. Uh, and these are the neighborhoods that we need to invest in um, with things like home ownership counseling. Those are dollars that have been reduced over time as the foreclosure crisis has minimized. But those, that is an investment in keeping people in their homes and fostering home ownership opportunities for communities of color. And I think that's really important, um, not an optional spending. Um, I'm really glad to see that we've moved away from talking about reducing funding for bicycle and pedestrian safety. These are critical dollars that, again, is a tiny portion of the amount of money that we spend on transportation system in the city. And, you know, th this is, these are investments that save lives. This is the green paint that we put down after a cyclist was killed near the University of Minnesota. These are high visibility crosswalks at transit stations in our highest pedestrian uh, neighborhoods. And, I can share the detailed information. This is really a, an investment that in, in one year doesn't reach, um, you know, it reaches a, a pretty small number of intersections in the city. So to create an ongoing investment in that, I think is very important. Um, you know, investing in equity, you know, I, having staff people that can direct the work to bring us forward on our staggering disparities in racial equity is a high priority for me, and I, I can't support cutting that position. Um, the Clean Energy Initiative, you know, I, I stood behind the mayor and Council Member Glidden and Council Member Gordon, who put so much effort into that partnership, and that was the beginning. That was the photo op for us to stand together and say, we want to get started on this work, and it relies on us making an investment as the city in bringing forward that work and holding our energy companies accountable. That is what the advocates who came here time after time again advocating for a change in our clean ener energy vision expect from us. And I think that reducing that to a half-time position, um, you know, would bring us backwards in terms of our commitment to making sure that that partnership is not just a feel-good one-time thing, that it's a true commitment in our city to have more sustainable and equitable energy solutions. Um, and so again, I mean, we spend $45 million a year just on the convention center and meet Minneapolis. We have a $500,000, these are again one-time dollars, um, you know, but we have a $400,000 increase proposed for meet Minneapolis, a $400,000 increase proposed for programming downtown. I mean, if these are, if, if we want to demonstrate fiscal, dispar re fiscal responsibility, I think there are other places within this budget that will not take from the people who need our investment the most. Councilmember Gordon. Uh, thank you very much. I also appreciate the effort, I guess, the intention here. I think uh, this is something that should probably be talked about early on in the budget process about what the what the levy should be. I think it was interesting um, this year, the, 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 maybe for the first time that I could remember, and I'm one of the, I guess, old timers here now, but when we had our public hearing, we actually didn't hear anybody come in and testify about the, the fear of the levies too large and property tax increases. Um, I think uh, this is actually maybe a year where we have a little breathing room. Uh, we really had some years where we were tight and we were talking about how deep and how far can we cut, and it, it's good that we don't have to this year. And I also think this year is a year because of the city growth, because of the population that's been coming in, when it actually makes complete sense that we need some services to match that population and as it's coming in. It's not that I'm opposed to any reductions either. I appreciate that Council Member Bender raised some issues. I, I wonder sometimes about the $400,000 for the new Holodazzle or what the, what the half a million dollars is gonna do for the convention center in Minneapolis. <clears throat> what about those things? Who are they benefiting? But I don't really wonder who, who's gonna benefit when we try to actually tackle the disparities that are going on in our city and address the inequities that are going on there. Um, basically, uh, we have the largest gaps between whites and people of cover among all large cities in the U.S. And to see the first thing cut here is our disparity study, the, the, what will give us the legal foundation to tackle um, the inequities when it comes to minority hiring um, is the first thing to get cut um, in half. And then I look further down 
down and I see that we want to um, cut the opposite of equitable outcomes. Um, that seemed to be, equity seemed to be the big issue of the campaign, something that we really want to work on, something that I've been wrestling with for years now, and finally when we have an opportunity to really make a difference and the mayor supporting making some headway here, we decide that we're going to cut that um, because that isn't as, Im as important, I guess, as making sure that meet Minneapolis and the Convention Center have their half a million dollars to, to bring in the big, uh, the, the big ticket items into our city. Um, I'm also very concerned just about the message that we're sending to our new partners in the Clean Energy Partnership when at the first budget we get to come in, we're saying that we're going to um, cut that and we don't want to see that um, be funded. It's pretty clear that if we cut that in half, we won't have the staff that we need to actually uh, work with that partnership. Uh, 150000 is probably less than we need to spend to make it really successful. Um, already the uh, utility companies have hired staff and donated staff to, to work on this and move forward and it's kind of sending the wrong message when we said we're committed and we're going to create this new partnership and it's not just to create a partnership this is an actual opportunity to move forward on what I think is one of the most critical crises of our time climate change and show how we can lead at the local level and we need to uh, to, to do that and if we if we can really do that and make a difference it's going to benefit um, all the people. Uh, um, I uh, think that we're going to have a much harder budget next year. I think um, maybe these efforts will be needed then just to see how we can we can get by. When you look at, um, I think it's the police department that probably gets most of our uh, our, our levy, 128 million, um, but not one of the one of the cuts proposed on here. Um, comes from that biggest department. It looks like it's coming from some of the uh, smaller, newer, most hopeful initiatives that we that we have. Um, so unfortunately, I won't be supporting this um, today. Uh, thank you. I've got uh, Council President Johnson and then Council Member Reich, followed by Council Member Yang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm just going to go through these things briefly. And uh, the civil rights disparity study, if you look at the budget book, is, is a two-year study. This funds the first year of the study. And the, the 300000 was put into the budget, and 150000 of it will be spent this year, and 150000 of it will be spent next year if we fund the second year. The city coordinators uh, department for the clean energy initiative, and I, you know, I wanted, I, I just want to say something. Mm -hmm. um, I participated in every single one of these meetings about this clean energy partnership, and everybody's given all the kudos to uh, Councilmember Glidden and Councilmember Gordon. I was at every single one of those meetings, and I have every confidence that the people that work in the department can absorb this within their existing work plan with an additional $75,000. I have no, they actually asked for $3 million to begin this clean energy partnership. So um, I, I think there are places in this budget where we have to ask people to, to um, what would you call it, uh, stiffen their backbones and add a little to their work plan. Uh, and this would be one place that that, that could happen. Uh, I want to point out that in the uh, Office of Equitable Outcomes, the only thing that this council has approved as far as equitable outcomes at this point is a definition of equity. And so to put 250, that's the only item that's come before this council. We don't have any idea of what this, these two positions would even do at this point. So to say you can have one position or you can have half of the money, let's see what happens. I don't disagree that we need to look at some of the places where we can make things better in this city, but I don't think we have to go full force with brand new spending. Then I want to say with this home ownership outreach, I'm so familiar with this program. They have $260,000 of unexpended money from their previous contract that they haven't spent. And they use it for foreclosure prevention. Thank goodness we've prevented foreclosures over and over, helped people to get their mortgages re, um, uh, reprogrammed, uh, to have savings, change their interest rate, all that sort of thing. But they have $260,000 of existing resources. So this is not a cut. Um, Anyway, I, I just think we have we have to be responsible. And I am the, the person who represents, along with Councilmember Yang and Councilmember Cano, with some of the most challenged neighborhoods in this city. And I'll tell you what, I don't see a whole lot of benefit for my for my constituents from having another study 
or from not funding the second year of the study yet, from uh, having uh, a reduction in the clean energy partnership. I don't, uh, my constituents aren't gonna care about that. Um, they're not gonna care that um, uh, we change some of the funding in uh, NCR, and they certainly are, aren't gonna care that the Office of Equitable Outcomes doesn't have two staff people. Council Member Reich. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I suppose one way to look at this as, as uh, Council President Johnson highlights, you know, having a program position or, or a study is not doing the actual work. It's not ma making the income or the outcome that we seek. The input does not guarantee the outcome output. Um, and a lot of this newer, newer ideas are great. I like new thinking and innovation. But until we've really nailed down the outcome that we expect to get from the input and can really tie the two together with some element of certainty, obviously there's no 100% certainty, um, it's, 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 it's more risky business to invest in something like that. Um, I am very you know, intrigued uh, if, we, if we are thinking about hedging for fiscal uh, stability in the future, then you know, I'd be even open to cutting the programs and putting it in reserve. I'd be willing to do that. Because then we're really hedging our bet for next year and the in the following year, knowing that there's some political uncertainty in terms of the state and their commitment that we rely on for basic services around LGA. Um, so, you know, I think the details are being discussed. I think it's been a really incredible conversation that's been initiated. Um, I, I very much uh, appreciate the the uh, on the ground uh, perspective that Council President Johnson shared. But I also appreciate the words uh, from Council Vice President Glidden to really think about these things programmatically and holistically. Uh, those are definitely two important lenses. So um, I just wanted to make those comments that we should make a distinction between inputs and outputs and making claims for one from the other. Council Member Yang. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I I wanted to first start out by um, thanking Council Member Pomozano for um, for doing this. I, as I jokingly said, her I kind of just almost think this is a nuclear option, but um, it's it's very much something that's um, appreciated because you know um, when I look at this, I want to echo what um, Council President Johnson said, which is, you know, I I don't think the sky is falling with any of these cuts. I really think that you know some of these things can be looked at differently and. That's exactly what Council um, Member Palmasano is doing with regards to this, and so you know I'm I'm going to support this. Uh, Council Member Fry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I won't echo everything that everyone else has said at this point, but uh, I would like to say I appreciate uh, Council Member Palmasano's effort on bringing this forward. It wasn't easy to find these monies. Uh, also, I appreciate the elimination of item number H. Uh, letter H, as I know Council Member Bender has worked a ton on getting uh, more pedestrian friendly areas through public works. Um, you know, I, I took a little bit of time and, and wrote up about a paragraph to myself here on uh, some, you know, the difference between kind of talking progressive and acting progressive, which is something that I've talked about in the past. And uh, so I'm just going to kind of read this paragraph and uh, see if you kind of get the gist of what I'm trying to say. To move the dial on racial equity, we must leverage community partnerships by collaborating with diverse and underrepresented community-based organizations. Such a holistic approach must be facilitated and layered by various work groups, task forces, and subcommittees that foster improved public engagement, highlighting the significant disparities faced by communities of color. Do you know what I just said? Absolutely nothing. Uh, and you know, the, the problem is, is that it's very easy to sound sexy um, to unload a bunch of fancy terms like layering and holistic and collaboration um, without an end result. Uh, you know, there, there is a motion that I will be bringing forward that does directly attack a lot of these, uh, the issues that we're experiencing right now as far as our opportunity gap. But, you know, I'm just looking at uh, letter number A down here, which is the Civil Rights Disparity Study in the civil rights departments for $150,000, uh, you know, we know there's a problem. There's a very serious problem that we need to deal with now. I'm not convinced that we need to study it anymore. Uh, we need to act. Um, so I will also be voting yes. Vice President Glidden, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just because of Council Member Fry's last comment, I actually wanted to um, 
maybe share with you what that disparity study is about. The disparity study isn't about just doing a general study of kind of what's happening in the city. This is the legal foundation that we are required to update on a regular basis that allows us to have a business inclusion program, that allows us to set goals um, for worker inclusion or business inclusion based on race and sex and other protected class categories. So if we do not do this study, we are not permitted or we can be legally challenged as other cities have been on our ability to have those programs. It's, it's a legal requirement. So um, fair enough, your point, um, another study isn't helpful. This one is actually part of what we are required to do to have these programs in place. Um, the timing of it, I think that's more a question for civil rights and the city attorney, um, but this is a requirement to do this study. Um, I wanted to make a, a comment on something that we have not yet um, talked about, um, which is um, uh, kind of getting back to um, uh, kind of the, the, the budget, uh, the structural balance of the budget. And, um, and, and I do want to say, I, I think uh, Council Member Goodman uh, can maybe remind me, I do not remember that there has been another proposal since I have been on the Council to reduce the property tax levy. I could be wrong, but this is just to say, I think this is, people sometimes vote against the budget, but this is really um, significant that you have put together the work to do this. And, it, and Council Member Goodman is right. It is worth arguing. It is not some crazy motion. It is something that is worth <laughs> arguing about whether we agree with it or not. And so I just, that is true. Um, and uh, it is a substantial amount of work to, to think through the pieces that could do that. I, I honestly don't think there's been another motion like this in the, the nine years I've been on the council. So, um, but one of the things, and I did talk to Councilmember Palmisano about this um, when we discussed her motion um, yesterday evening, that was kind of my higher, bigger picture concern, is what hole this might create for the budget in our coming years. So um, when you set the levy at a certain amount, you are essentially, you are setting the base. It's that base that then allows you to um, be able to do other things that you may want to do in the future. The more you reduce that base beyond what is kind of intended to be covered in the, in the budget, the more you're creating a hole that then you have to figure out how are we going to fill that hole in the future year. Um, so for example, if we reduce the budget, then that means that next year there may be more um, challenge. There may be more of a need to increase um, property taxes to be able to cover that hole in the base as well as covering inflation and perhaps other new spending that we might be thinking of. I think uh, one of the most significant pieces of additional spending that has definitely been part of the conversation this year and I know will be part of the conversation next year will be public safety spending. So this is really uh, another piece of what is at play. If we reduce the base, then what is our ability to fund these things that we may want to do in future years? Next year, uh, just to kind of call out something that I think we all have uh, paid attention to, but just kind of play it out. Uh, we don't know if there may be additional challenges depending on what happens at the legislature. I will say this is not unusual. It seems like since I've been on this council, it's like every couple of years, there has been something that has been, uh, you know, um, uh, catastrophic uh, emergency to deal with, and, and there have been very, very big challenges. But we do know that uh, right now we have leadership in the Senate that is very sympathetic to rural interests. We have Republican leadership in the House that is trying to, again, kind of play on this sort of dichotomy between how do we um, appease uh, these different sections of our state that have different needs, but all rely on local government aid as a piece to ensure that we have good revenue sharing between the state and the cities. So um, we need to be cognizant that we may have a challenge that comes about next year, which would create an additional budget hole for us to have to fill. So um, if I am looking at what's the result here, which is um, uh, something less than the 0.38% property tax decrease. Um, 
<clears throat> I want to know what will be the impact on residents in future years in addition to are there pieces here that I may disagree with. And there are some pieces in here that I disagree with. I would rather uh, ensure that this Office of Equitable Outcomes is fully funded. I do know from talking to our city coordinator, he feels extreme um, need for these positions. I know that he has spoken to some others about it. Um, uh, I will say when we've funded things like sustainability folks in the coordinator's office, this seems to be passed without any controversy, but um, so be it. Um, I think this is part of the staples of just getting the work done um, and talking about the outcomes that we seem to want to talk about so much. So um, I am concerned about creating a budget hole. That is actually the primary reason that I will not be able to support this budget um, or this uh, amendment. Um, again, I think this is really some groundbreaking work that you have done. This just is not frequently done, um, is finding a way to make a proposal worth discussing that re results in a property tax decrease. Um, to me, though, I think the benefits from that decrease are less than the challenges that it creates, both for the budget in the long run and to programs that I will just say are important to myself, my constituents, and some of our very significant partners, including Excel Energy and CenterPoint that are looking forward to working with us on the Clean Energy Partnership. Uh, Council Member Goodman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to reply to Councilmember Glidden. I can't think exactly which year was which, but there were five or six years of seven and eight percent tax increases during that period of time. So obviously no one was able to bring forward a motion to lower the levy because we lost a vast amount of local government aid during that period. And so what happens is you have this multiplier effect. We increase 7%, the base goes up, then you increase 7 more percent, the base goes up, then you increase 8%, the base goes up at the same time uh, that our employees are taking a pay freeze um, and our union contracts were shaky because of the way we had treated our staff for so long. Um, then the mayor at that time came back and asked for a freeze in the levy and we had had a freeze in the levy uh, for the past couple of years, as I've noted ironically in an election year. Um, so that was clearly part of what was going on at that time. I do want to note, though, um, someone had said earlier that no one spoke in favor of a tax decrease. I want you to know that I got my truth and taxation notice the Monday before the Tuesday hearing, and I'd be surprised if anyone got it much before that. The county didn't even mail them out until the Friday before the hearing. So if the first class mail went really fast, people might have gotten it on Saturday, depending on your proximity to a post office. Um, but my office got plenty of calls about tax taxes and the tax increase. And while I'm not going to blame us since we don't send out the notices, uh, organizations that want us to spend money had months to organize. And uh, individuals and staff that wanted us to spend money and can come and talk to us about the horrible things that will happen if they don't get these increases are always going to say that in order to make sure that they're not a target for a cut when anyone is thinking about reducing the levy. So we didn't give people the time to come and talk to us about a tax increase based on when the um, notice of increase went out. And it's not just what we do in terms of our levy, it's the 4% for the park board, the 2.5% for the school board, the county's increase, cumulative with a lot of people who are seeing increases in values. And often those increases in values are seniors who are not selling their homes, so they're just paying more. I have constituents who pay more in property taxes than they bought their house for. I'm not sure what that says, but what it says is our city is unaffordable and we're never gonna be able to put enough money into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in order to solve that problem or we're never gonna have a living wage high enough in order to get people to live in our city and not in a precariously housed situation. So the property tax equation like affordable housing and the minimum wage are all tied together into an index of what it's like to live in our city and property taxes are a piece of it that we can both do something about and make a point about today. Council President Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just want to reinforce one thing that uh, Council Member Palmasano um, mentioned. And, and I think in some ways um, it's unique for us that serve um, the corners of the city uh, that people do pay attention to what's going on across the street. You know, um, I border Robbinsdale, I border Brooklyn Center. Now those are not um, highly um, I, I, they're fairly heavily taxed. So there isn't a the huge disparity that you see in some of the communities like Southwest Minneapolis, but it is really a challenge for people. And when they make decisions about where they're gonna move and they look at the equation of uh, being in a place where uh, they can even get more house uh, for, for their dollar and uh, less property taxes, it's a decision that's easy to make for a lot of uh, families. And so 
I think it is really concerning that we get out of whack with the, pro with the uh, communities that surround us. And again, people do pay attention to that. Vice President Glidden, UNQ. Thanks, Mr. Chair. There was just one other environmental factor going on this year that I just um, wanted to put out there. And if there's additional comments from staff on this to kind of correct me or, or say I'm right. Um, but my um, understanding is that we have had this year and utilized this year a greater amount of one-time funding sources or general fund, uh, fund balance, you might call it, that we have utilized in trying to create the budget for this year than we often do. Um, and we have uh, utilized that, I think, to full effect to, um, in the mayor's, uh, the, the proposal actually by the mayor has a lower general uh, fund than was um, in place last year, which actually is really unusual. Um, so um, so there is that. But I just say this because we're kind of in a bit of an unusual place this year um, with the budget and with the one-time funds that we are seeing. Again, if um, A, it, I don't know that we would expect to have this amount of one-time funds available next year, and maybe Mr. Carpenter um, or Ms. Christensen can speak on this just um, to, to help uh, us understand that, but also there may be some additional pressures on the on what fund balance we do have again to be able to plan for the unexpected, whatever that might be that could happen, whether it's in the legislative session or otherwise. Ms. Christensen, if you could probably uh, try to address a few of these, I guess I'd like to um, start a little bit before we address uh, Vice President's um, question specifically. I wanted to point out a few things. One is, first of all, the levy increase that we're seeing um, in our city is actually not an increase. Uh, from last year, the general fund levy through property taxes is uh, down 1.5%. That's a change of about $157 million to $155 million. Um, so we're already experiencing a, a levy at this point that is lower than last year's levy. We're able to support that with a lot of one-time spending and uh, through the practical, uh, judicious uh, spending that we've had in place this past year, the past two years, we're able to uh, put aside some of that um, tax revenues to help buy down this levy. I also wanted to point out that we know, as Vice President Glidden pointed out earlier, there's significant pressures that is a real pinch point that we potentially face in the next year at the state legislature as it relates to local government aid. So this proposal, as it's uh, outlined now, although I totally support the idea of reducing property taxes to its lowest point possible, uh, and compliment Council Member Palmasano for taking this tough action, uh, and do, doing the hard work, it's going to put us in a place that's going to make it harder to dig out of next year because we're going to be facing a higher property tax lever, levy increase in next year's budget if we don't take if we take this action today. Um, there's also draft legislation, as I understand, at the legislature to reinstate the levy limits. So we're going to, and that's going to be much tougher language. So we're going to be having a harder time next year getting out of a hole that's created through this action that'll make it harder uh, compounded by the difficulty at the state legislature. And I also wanted to point out the average levy increase statewide is 4.6%. We're right now at 2.4%. And because our levy increase is actually a decrease, our levy amount is a decrease from last year. That's just the remarkable savings and financial practices that have been put in place that puts us in this position now, which is half of what every other community in the state is experiencing. There's a lot of reasons individually we can pick and choose because I think Council President and uh, Council Member Goodman are exactly right. This is an opportunity to state how can we save money and how can that articulate our position in uh, saving taxpayer money, which is absolutely everybody's interest. Uh, but this particular proposal, as it looks now, um, 
uh, just does not go to a point where it's a significant impact to the uh, individual resident. We're talking about, if you look at the bottom of uh, Councilmember Palmasano's motion, the impact on a taxpayer, realizing, of course, that 57% of our residents have already experienced a decrease, will be saving on a median priced home of $180,000, $5. Doing the quick calculation of the market value of my house, I will be increased $6. I will have an opportunity to save $6 next year through this action. I personally, uh, Councilmember Goodman spoke to her property taxes and her constituents' property taxes. I think $6 is a, a good investment to be, actually put forward some of the things that we've identified as their goals and strategies for the city. And that this budget uh, brings us to the level that we're able to accomplish what we can do. Uh, so I don't know, I probably distracted you from the actual question, Ms. Christensen, that uh, Council Vice President Glidden uh, brought forward. So if you could address her question, that would be helpful. Council Vice President, I don't know if you need to re, re, uh, restate your question as she's in front of you. Do you know your question? Do you remember what it was? Uh, <laughs> as I recall, um, we were discussing the um, uh, volume of one-time funded activities in the 2015 recommended budget. The uh, 2015 recommended budget includes about $13 million worth of uh, fund balance funded or one-time funded activities. About $8 million of that is cars, meaning about $5 million of the items that are proposed with the mayor's recommendation rely on the fund balance uh, for one-time funding. Um, this is less than what was in 2014. However, uh, there were a number of uh, items incorporated in the 2014 budget, including utilization of the property tax uh, stabilization fund of about $5 million which uh, is, is one factor uh, in the pressures on the 2015 uh, budget is the uh, backfilling of permanent funding for one-time activities. Uh, as Council Member Quincy articulated, the 2.4% um, city levy uh, incorporates uh, several different pieces, including the city's debt levy, uh, which is increasing by about $6 million. So, in large part, uh, that is the uh, driver behind the increase in the levy. The uh, Parks Board uh, had a recommendation by the mayor of about a $1 million increase, and there was a 1.5% decrease in the general fund, uh, which we were able to, uh, city's able to capitalize on non-tax revenues to uh, maintain its services despite taking the reduction. Uh, so with the, the one-time funding, there is about $5 million of activities. Some of them may eventually be proposed to be brought forward as an ongoing activity, which would um, uh, result in a levy discussion or some other general fund ongoing revenue discussion. Um, but that's kind of the magnitude of where that's at. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't want to take up too much more time. I just wanted to briefly comment on some of the other comments um, that were that were brought forward. I want to make a point that some of this is about incurring new spending as it comes due. I agree. The disparity study is extremely important, and I've never seen a budget in my 15 years in other entities that doesn't incur the spence in the year that it comes due. So. I don't believe that I've structurally unbalanced any of this budget. I think that I have stepped very gently. Um, I don't think I've created a funding hole. Um, and I also wanted to point out that I know we're all biased here. I mean, I choose to live on my side of the street in Minneapolis instead of a suburb every day of the week. And we do that every time our property taxes come due. Um, I do think that the structural balance has been changed with the removal of Part H. Um, it does both then take some ongoing cuts to create a levy of $745,000 total levy reduction instead of $1.075 million. Uh, it also reduces some of the one-time charges. So I do think it gives some leeway and headroom for that 
next year. Um, so I guess I would just, just wanna say that I do think that this isn't, isn't about a levy increase, but it's about our whole budget. This is the one time a year that we talk about our entire budget as a whole. So it's not about $7 million to me, it's about one point X billion dollars with this increase. I think we've been good financial stewards of this in the past, much to the credit of people sitting up here. And, and so as Chair Quincy articulates, we reap the benefits of that in the next year. Uh, the park board levy, which is significant this year, uh, is not just one that I support, it doesn't matter, we don't get to vote on that, uh, but it does weigh heavily into the decision that I've made to bring this kind of motion forward. So thank you. Vice President, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member Reich was in here before you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and I try not to forward too many questions, uh, you know, at this point in time when we're in chambers, but um, it, broadly speaking, it seems like we're trying to do two things at the same time. I'm very compelled by the notion of being concerned about future budgets. That, that'll always get me, uh, get my attention. Um, however, can we have it both ways? Can we introduce a lot of new spending, a lot of new ideas, and then fret about what's gonna happen next year or the following years? I mean, it's almost like pick. Let's bunker down because there's gonna be tough times ahead. The storms are, the dark clouds are forming over at the Capitol and we're gonna have to really be prepared for the worst. Well, then we should be following through on that program. Um, so that's why I would like to you know, find some savings and put it in, the, in our reserve. That's where I'd like it to go. But it, we're not in a position to really do that right now. And so I'm very much conflicted about how to, to approach this because I can't land the plane where I'd like to land it. Uh, but we wouldn't even have this conversation if, if it wasn't initiated boldly uh, by the people who proposed it. So, um, you know, I just wish there was a clear pattern. Let's be cautious or let's do new things. So again, trying to mull it through. However, I would like to ask one question and I tend to not do this often, but this is probably a finance question. What would our ability to do uh, to find cuts and put it into reserve procedurally and what actual impact would that allow us for future years? Just the mechanics of that. Mr. Carpenter, could you talk about a property tax stabilization account? Chair Quincy, Council Member Reich, uh, the property tax stabilization account in prior years is a, was a result of continuing to levy dollars at a higher than otherwise we would have had to do to expend money, to bank money raised from a variety of sources to cushion future tax rates, tax levies, to be lower than they would otherwise have to be given the then current spending decisions the council and the mayor were making. So it is a I'm sympathetic to council member Reich's analogy about the plane that's hard to land. Uh, it is true that we have budgetary pressures looming. It is also true that we have a variety of uh, non-tax levy revenues that have increased somewhat dramatically over the last few years, which has allowed us some cushion to spend money on new things without getting too upside down from a long-term financial stewardship perspective. The challenge from a financial perspective remains, how do you call when those future revenue sources start to either decelerate in their upward growth or actually decline. And there's no right answer to that. It is art, not science. Um, but that is a big part of why we've been able to spend money and still have relatively tapered recent levy increases. It's not my position to articulate a specific position on whether this levy or any other levers is 1% too high or too low. We all know the tax burden faced by residents of the city on property taxes. We also know as Council President Johnson said that all the money that comes into the city comes from citizens, many of whom are residents, but not all of whom. So it's balancing out those different um, objectives and making the best guess you can about the future sufficiency of revenues to fund what we think your priorities are. 
Thank you. Council Member Wright, do you still have anything else or you still have the floor? Okay. I'm going to go with the, uh, it looks like uh, Council President Johnson has a priority. Motion Ms. Request. Mr. Chair, I just uh, have a question for Mr. Carpenter. Please. Could I ask? Uh, Mr. Carpenter, we have had, I think, one time where we had this um, tax, um, what do we call it, property tax, uh, but didn't we not take that out of uh, rollover dollars? Mr. I think I'm right when I say that. Mr. Chair, Council President Johnson, technically it didn't come out of rollover, it came out of fund balance. Fund because, balance, yes. Because yes. what didn't it roll, arises we, we, from yes. is we had more from revenue. Underspending, underspending budgets, which produced. Underspending budgets yes. and more revenue besides yes. the property tax, which okay. is the most certain one once we set it of right. what it will generate. Okay, thank you, thank you. Vice President Quinn. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I am going to make a motion to amend uh, Councilmember Palmisano's underlying motion, which she has put in front of us. Um, and my motion is going to be to uh, delete items A and B from her motion. Um, items A and B are two uh, one-time uh, funded initiatives, as both Councilmember Palmisano and Ms. Christensen have told us this will not have an impact on the levy, which I think has been the major um, discussion that we have been having is how to impact the levy and what has that impact on the levy. So um, I'd like to make this motion to eliminate items A and B. Thank you for that. Um, procedurally, should we be able to have, we're yep. going to have conversation on the substitute motion? That's nope, in front on of the us, amendment. On the amendment, on the, on the amendment to the motion. Uh, so that's what uh, we moved over to, if you could slide the, uh, on the first amendment. Uh, and as we do that technical, uh, we've been joined by Mayor Hodges. Uh, would you like to uh, address this topic or in general? Okay, thank you very much. All right. Any questions on the substitute or on the uh, amendment uh, the glit, uh, glit, that Council Vice President Glidden just offered? Uh, Council Member Andrew Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a quick technical uh, question here, and maybe I'll defer to Council Vice President Glidden. Um, if we're deleting those two items, would those potentially change the shift of some of these funds as they affect other things? And if so. Uh, I'd be happy to amend the amendment that the items A and B be deleted, but that uh, $225,000 be taken from one-time uh, funding for the convention center in the amount of $500,000 for marketing to backfill those two items uh, as this is kind of adjusted around so that those shifts are not um, touched, if that makes sense. If not, I, I guess I'll uh, explain then. So to give you an example, if item B is being deleted for $75,000, down on item G, there's a proposal to use $75,000 in one-time funding. So by deleting item B, we would impact uh, item G within the proposal. And so that's what I'm getting at, that if uh, we have impacts downstream as a result of deleting items A and B, which I, I'm supportive of, then I would uh, propose uh, an amendment to uh, make up that difference through the one-time funding going to the convention center. I, I think procedurally, I think we're a little deep on the amendment itself. We, I do believe, Mr. Chair, we have one more layer we can go. Technically, this is an amendment. Um, that's the underlying motion. I would just note, since this is my amendment, that um, I think you could make another amendment after this if you have something additional you want to do or, or, or correct. So I think, as I understand it, the chair has called that we are as deep as we can go, and so we just need to vote on this one. That's my understanding as well. Mr. Clerk, could you confirm that? Mr. Chair, all amendments brought forward are amendment to the main motion, which is approval of the mayor's proposed budget. So we already have two uh, amendments before us. Uh, any further conversation on the Glidden Amendment? Not seeing any. I'd like to call a uh, roll call on the uh, uh, Glidden Amendment, please. Council Member Glidden. Aye. 
Yang. Nay. Bender. Hi. Johnson. Aye. Hamasano. Nay. Reich. Nay. Gordon. Aye. Fry. Nay. President Johnson. Nay. Orsami. Nay. Goodman. Nay. Kano. Aye. Chair Quincy. Aye. There are six ayes and seven nays. Thank you. So we're going back to um, conversation on the original amendment uh, offered by Paul Masano, Council President Johnson. No, it was Council Member Bender was next. Oh, I, I apologize. It's crossed out on my list. Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to offer an amendment to Council Member Palmasano's amendment to remove F, reduce ongoing funding in the city coordinator's department for the Office of Equitable Outcomes by $125,000 from this proposal. So on that amendment, as you're putting that up uh, on the speaker management, any conversation on that as proposed by amendment by Bender? Mr. Chair, if I may, I'd speak to that. Please do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I know there's been a lot of conversation about whether or not we need two positions to focus on equity instead of just one. Um, you know, this is a, a piece of our adopted city values and vision and goals that we all worked on together at the beginning of the year. So that was one time that we made a commitment as a city body to focusing on our racial and social equity issues in the city. Uh, we have some of the worst disparities in the country in health, education, employment, um, and these are things that are harming our overall city. And this is the time where we get to, you know, put our money where our mouths are. This is the time when we get to say that we are talking about taking action. The intention of these two FTEs is for one, to focus on the important internal work of our city to increase the diversity of our own city enterprise to make sure that our city demonstrates its commitment to equity through our own policies and internal procedures. And the other person would focus on external efforts, including re helping focus resources into our racially concentrated areas of poverty, which reach across our city and touch many of our wards, including mine. Um, so this is something that I think is, is a really important ongoing commitment to the city. And that's why I would support removing it from this proposal. Thank you. Uh, Council President Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, as someone who represents uh, neighborhoods that are uh, heavily impacted by this new designation of racially concentrated areas of poverty, uh, I cannot imagine what uh, my constituents would uh, say about another staff person uh, to try and deal with these uh, kinds of problems. Now, uh, it might be more important that we actually have a housing director in this city. Uh, it is now November, oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's December 1st, and we are with, continuing without a housing director. We also now, uh, just this week, got a notice that the person that does housing finance for the city is leaving us. And so, um, you know, those kind of things, again, internally, that actually make a difference uh, would be so important, it seems to me, rather than funding a new position Ask for two. We're going down to one uh, in this in this arena of um, what are we calling it? The Office of Equitable Outcomes. Um, uh, again, staff people do not produce, uh, nor do reports produce outcomes. Uh, so I'm encouraging people to vote no on this, and I'm going to call the question on the main motion. Or excuse me, on on uh, Councilmember Palmasano's motion. Uh, we're on the. Can I do that? I, we're on no. the Bender Amendment at this no. okay. point, Council President. Right. I get your point. All right. <laughs> um, we have uh, Council Member Yang and Council Member Johnson on the vendor appointment uh, amendment. Um, but uh, Mayor mm -hmm. Hodges, mm -hmm. if you'd like to speak to that, as you requested. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for letting me speak in your committee today. Uh, I have been keeping track of the conversation and understand it's a lively debate. I have been in the seat of consideration of the levy um, as a council member and now as mayor. Um, and I understand, um, you know, the pull on both sides. Uh, but the amendment before you right now is about these two positions in the coordinator's office. Um, I have had individual conversations with, I think most of you, about these positions, about their value. Um, and I think, um, you know, the city coordinator himself 
uh, knowing what the work is, knowing that if we want to have this be something that we do in every single department in the city, um, that every single department touches these issues, and to have the capacity to organize and coordinate that work inside the city enterprise, which is something we've all signed on to, um, as well as the partnerships that we have, that if we can manage them effectively, can really make an impact for people. We have hundreds of people out there now who have agreed um, with their resources and their organizations, government organizations, nonprofit organizations, uh, with their resources, if we can and as we corral that, we are going to be able to make a big difference. That this first year has been a lot about you know, building the relationships needed and setting the foundation for future work. It was a year ago that many of us were elected on a platform of getting this work done and it was almost a year ago that we all got together in a room and set the goals. And Frankly, I've had conversations with many of you talking about the value and the importance of these positions uh, to me and to the city moving forward. And so I would ask for support for this amendment today. I would ask for support of supporting, making sure we have two positions in the city coordinator's office to do this work. Um, I know that, you know, there are other arguments to be made about other pieces of this, but this is the one piece that I've had conversations with you guys about and would appreciate your support. Uh, thank you. Um, Council President, were you uh, on this amendment in queue? That's already done. That's not crossed out on my list. I'm sorry. Uh, Council Member Yang on the vendor amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, when I look at this amendment, I, I think about how there were two positions and now it just is going to be reduced to one. And, you know, I, I look at, I mean, my experience on this council for the past year and, you know, working alongside my colleagues with regards to trying to get to a point where we have a racial equity uh, plan. And, you know, we're supposed to have this toolkit in place. We haven't approved a toolkit. I mean, we uh, struggle along to get an equity definition and you know in in our plan my sense of what we were trying to do was we were trying to embed or layer how we do racial equity within each department so that we wouldn't need you know two or three staffers i mean getting one staffer for this should be sufficient i in my view and so i'm not going to support this council member andrew johnson thank you mr chair uh I originally had looked at this position and thought, boy, maybe we can actually make up some of this uh, work with some spare resources in the coordinator's office. I was actually looking at it because I wanted to increase the FTE for our firefighters. So I reached out to Spencer Cronk, our city coordinator, and I said, hey, I've heard you might have some, some spare resources in the coordinator's office. Could you cover this work? And he pushed back so hard and said, look, we have all these departments doing all these different things. We're trying to be inclusive and we're trying to uh, figure out how we can do better outreach to renters and the rest of the community. And if there was one thing that he would push back on, it would be this. And I took him at his word for that. And I think that this is a position that is necessary along with the other one. And even when we talk about the general amendment, looking at programs like One Minneapolis where that's our, uh, that's our mechanism for funding uh, the recruitment and the training of people of color to be leaders and help diversify our boards and neighborhoods and other commissions and groups. So I, I'm concerned and uh, we'll be voting uh, yes on this particular amendment and, and believe we need to keep this position uh, in our budget. Thank you. Further comments on the Bender Amendment? Not seeing any. I was wondering if Mr. Carl, uh, or between Mr. Carl and uh, Ms. Christensen, make sure we know what we're voting on, on the Bender Amendment. Uh, could we, you clarify that for me, please? Mr. Chair, as I understand it, Councilmember Bender has moved an amendment to the amendment standing from Councilmember Palmasano that would remove Section F, reducing the ongoing funding in the City Coordinator Department for the Office of Equitable Outcomes by $125,000. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the Bender Amendment as outlined by Mr. Carl, uh, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. 
Will we need a roll call, please? Councilmember Glidden. Aye. Yang. Nay. Bender. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Nay. Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fry. Nay. President Johnson. No. Warsami. Nay. Goodman. Nay. Kano. Aye. Chair Quincy. Aye. There are seven ayes and six nays. Um, I'm going to la ask for all those in queue on the uh, uh, Palomasano uh, motion, which is an amendment to the recommended budget. Um, are, are people like to stay in queue for that, or should we move to a uh, call the question on that particular item as amended? I'm seeing everybody's members. still in queue, so I'm just checking in. Okay. Council President Johnson? Mr. Chair, I call the question. Thank you. I think in deference, as we're in a committee instead of, we don't need to have a, a vote on that. I think we're all in, in alignment. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and um, have a vote on the Palmasano motion as amended. And could we review that motion? Because that's not in paper in front of us. Mr. Carl? Mr. Chair? Council Member Johnson? Uh, will there be a vote on call the question? I'm sorry? Is there gonna be a vote on call the question? No, the question's been called. Usually, you, uh, yeah, if the clerk the, could clarify, wouldn't there be normally a call the question vote? I Mr. did, uh, if Mr. not, I would like to make a motion. Mr. Chair, I know that you mentioned at the beginning of the meeting we were proceeding informally, and that if anyone objects, we would, of course, follow the normal procedure, which is a motion, a second, and a vote. Um, you had already <laughs> mentioned that you were going to close discussion. If you choose to um, proceed with other discussion, of course, that would be your prerogative. I'm, I'm not sure where I'm at. <laughs> I'm even a little lost in this I process. think Council Member Johnson just mentioned he had some other amendments or another discussion he wanted to make if you wanted to um, recognize him with the I understand. Board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Andrew Johnson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to make an amendment on the I, item B that the $75,000, that item B be deleted and that the $75,000 in the proposal be funded uh, by decreasing the convention center's one-time $500,000 uh, marketing expenditure uh, accordingly by $75,000. That's for item B. I see. <clears throat> Mr. Carr, are we... I have the discretion to um, honor uh, the... Amendment, or the, I'm sorry, Council President's interest in. Go ahead, Council President. Uh, Mr. Chair, I really want to go back because I called the question. Um, we we may be uh, acting informally, uh, but uh, if I remember correctly, a call the question um, motion is not debatable. I mean, and if you want to get a a second to call the question, that's fine. If you want to take a vote on call the question, the question is: Is it a majority vote or is it a um, yep. Super majority vote. So perhaps Mr. Carl can qualify that, uh, can answer that question, and then we move forward from there. Because I think Councilmember Johnson, not to be unkind, but is out of order on this, I'm, that the question was called, and let's act through Robert's rules about how you deal with that. I would, uh, I would agree, Council President. Uh, we're going to say Council Member Johnson's uh, motion is that tad premature uh, because I had already called for a close uh, of conversation. So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna recognize uh, uh, Mayor Hodges as uh, hers was a last second entry and request to speak. If, they, if you're will, willing to entertain um, conversation from Mayor Hodges, I'd like to do that. So Mayor Hodges, can I recognize you? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and I, um congratulate you on taking on a very challenging job. I know uh, that uh, doing this with a committee was a challenge and doing it with a full council. Um, I appreciate that and then as a result appreciate your willingness to let me speak today. Um, I'm going to speak against this motion overall. Um, it looks like there are at least pieces of it that people support um, and I understand that. But overall I would say there are some key pieces in here um, and I appreciate the fact that that 
the voted down, uh, you know, taking that equity position away from the coordinator's office. But there are other pieces in here. Um, the disparity study in the Civil Rights Department isn't an extra, and it's not to sort of stroke ourselves on the hair to say we're doing something really great by you know, defining the problem. What we're actually doing is what we're required to do to make the case for the standards we need to set that people have to meet. You have to do a disparity study to know what goals you need to set for the work that's being done by the city proper, but also uh, what we expect, the contract compliance we expect from businesses throughout the city. This isn't just some sort of feel-good extra. This is a baseline work that we need to do. Um, the piece about um, the One Minneapolis Fund in the, in the NCR department, I'm gonna make a case for that. I know there are people who are concerned with how neighborhood organizations are functioning or uh, you know, what is it that the NCR department does. But one of the key measurable, uh, one of the key measurable outcomes uh, that we've had in the last few years has been with this One Minneapolis Fund, where neighborhoods and organizations put together their best idea about how to build capacity and leadership among underrepresented communities in the city of Minneapolis. And their outcomes have been great. There's been a lot of leadership that's been built. There's been a lot of capacity that's been built. And an investment there is a strong and important investment, regardless of what you think um, about the rest of the work that's being done, uh, whether I agree with that or not. Um, you know, the home ownership counseling and outreach has made a huge difference for people. We are still suffering the effects of the, um, we're still suffering the effects of the foreclosure crisis. Some of our neighborhoods are not feeling it the way that they used to, but a lot of our neighborhoods still are. And those investments are crucial steps for people to become owners, to go from renting to owning or for not having ownership uh, opportunities to having ownership opportunities. Um, the one other argument that I wanted to make um, was regarding the clean energy initiative dollars. Um, this is our measurable way to make good commitments that we made to XL Energy and to Center Point Energy. The business community, um, the business community is looking to us for what is our investment and what are we going to do um, to back that up and what is our capacity to do that. And I think that that investment is important, and that's an important uh, signal to send um, in our partnership that we put together. So overall, um, I think the impact of doing this um, for communities, particularly distressed communities, is negligible. Um, but the impact of actually moving forward with the items on the list will be considerable. And so I would speak against it sort of in total, in principle. Um, but also individually, item by item. So thank you for the time. Um, as we move to a vote on this, as we're recognizing a call on the question, um, I wondered if, uh, Mr. Carl, if you could restate the uh, uh, amended uh, amendment. Mr. Chair, the amendment offered by Councilmember Palmasano to the mayor's proposed budget is a reduction in property tax levy increase Item A, reducing 50% of one-time funding for a civil rights disparity study in the Civil Rights Department by $150,000. B, reducing 50% of the one-time funding in the City Coordinator Department for the Clean Energy Initiative of $150,000, a reduction of $75,000. C, reducing the one-time funding in the Convention Center by $100,000. D, eliminating a tax increment funded activity in the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department by $150,000 for staff program expenses and $150,000 recommended for the One Minneapolis Fund and utilizing $300,000 of TIF to replace general fund resources in the Neighborhood Community Relations Department. E, reduce ongoing funding for health insurance by, I believe, $120,000 to reflect lower premium. F has been re removed by the Bender Amendment. G, reduce ongoing funding and community planning and economic development for home ownership, counseling, and outreach by $125,000 and shifting an additional $75,000 to one-time grant funding or one-time funding. And then H has been removed at the request of Council Member Palmasano, the maker of the motion. Thank you. All those in, in favor of the Palmasano motion as amended, clerk will call a roll, please. Council Member Glidden. Councilmember Yang? Aye. Bender? No. Johnson? No. Palmasano? Aye. Reich? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Fry? Aye. Aye. President Johnson? Aye. Warsami? Aye. 
Goodman. Aye. Cano. Yes. Chair Quincy. Nay. There are seven ayes and six nays. Council Vice President Glidden. Thanks. I have a follow-up question for staff. Just, um, uh, I had asked a question previously on what was the impact to property taxes of this motion, and I'd like to know right now what's the impact to property taxes of this final motion that was just approved by the council. So I have $700,000 in one time, excuse me, in ongoing funds that have been removed from the budget. What does that amount to in terms of the actual levy reduction? And if I'm incorrect on that amount, please help me. Uh, Chair Quincy, Council Member Glidden, um, Having uh, incorporated Councilmember Bender's amendment to the motion uh, impacts the reduction in the property tax increase to $620,000. Okay. And what is that then percent of the levy that's reduced and what will that amount to for the typical homeowner? That will um, be approximately 50% of the original impact. So we would be seeing about a 2 point two percent levy increase and the impact on the median $180,000 house would be about um, $2.5. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hey, thank you, everyone. Um, long discussion. I just want to give everybody a time check. We're looking to uh, conclude today's activities by 4 um, because the Planning Commission has the room after that. So we're going to charge through with the additional um, proposed amendments that are in front of us. I think we're on item six. This is a um, the motion by Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry to catch you off guard. No, no, I'm good. Thank sort you. through the paper stack. Uh, so we're on item number six, a motion to amend the 15, 2015 budget in Regulatory Services Department to include funding for home line services in the amount of $100,000. I work closely with the Regulatory Services Department and the Mayor's Office on this um, motion. Uh, finance could answer any specific questions about the funding source. Um, Homeline just began service in Minneapolis. They have been operating outside of the city uh, prior to that, and they are providing a lot of services to our residents who rent. 50% uh, of our households in the city are, are renter households. Um, this year, they are on target to advise more than the 300 3,200 households that they originally projected to serve in their first year. So this allows them to continue operating within the city. Um, they are serving renters um, in multiple languages and helping with a lot of the issues that we're seeing as our rental prices increase um, due to the fact that we have a very low rental vacancy rate in the city. Um, and so they've been working very closely with the department on this. And this motion also includes a report back to make sure that the department um, you know, is front and center and making sure that this is a useful resource to them and that the department and our city staff are really driving this work. Thank you. My uh, speaker management is faulty a little bit. Uh, Council Member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I am a big fan of Homeline. Uh, in fact, in a time at which um, private developers were opting out of paying off their, they were paying off their 30 year mortgages early, Homeline went in and really helped um, Russian immigrants and other non-English speaking tenants um, deal with the crisis that they were dealing with. My question for staff is don't we already fund them and if so, how much and is this an increase and are we moving down the line of we're funding nonprofits now? So this is a new line item to fund a nonprofit and how does that fit into all of the other work we're doing? <coughs> I think we do give them money now. My understanding is that they're not currently funded uh, in the 14 budget as they ex, uh, expanded their service operation to include Minneapolis. Uh, so this is a uh, the opportunity to, to fund them uh, at $100,000. Well, I, I love how you call it an opportunity. Everything is an investment and an opportunity. I do think that they are a very worthy organization doing extremely good work on the housing end. I just uh, worry about the very slippery slope of Every nonprofit doing this good work is going to be asking us for money, and how are we fitting this into the larger picture? Does reg services have, does it let them do less of something? 
for example, Council Member Bender, do you know is there work that we're doing now that Homeline could be doing so we could think of it as something that would take less time from our staff? I need to understand how this isn't just a pick my favorite nonprofit doing good work and give them money. We have a, a number of questions. Uh, that was a question for Council Member Bender. Uh, would you care to respond to that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to try to answer these questions. So, um, so we do not currently fund Homeline. They have funding um, from outside sources that allowed them to begin operating in the city this year. Um, but that was a one-time um, investment for them. And so this would allow them to keep operating in the city. Um, they are working closely with regulatory services, although they probably also overlap with other um, departments in the city, like NCR, maybe even CPED in the, um, maybe even our city, um, any legal resources that we provide. Um, so because they're really answering a lot of legal questions for renters. Um, the reason I worked very closely with the department was to make sure to answer those questions um, that this wasn't just a random nonprofit that we were choosing to fund, but rather someone that's already working hand in hand with our city departments. Uh, they are able to um, provide more flexibility in their services. Um, again, they're working very closely with regulatory services. There's data sharing going back and forth. Um, they're really able to collect a lot of data, for example, on problem landlord, landlords that are coming up over and over and over again. That's a complement to the work that our, our, our own city staff are doing. So again, the intention here is for regulatory services to make that call when they report back and let us know how this is going. But staff does support this, this funding in this budget. I did want to uh, highlight that uh, for Councilmember Goodman that it was uh, regulatory staff uh, that uh, was contacted and the source of using the revolving fund uh, was appropriate to absorb. It won't uh, change the staff allocations of our inspectors, for example. Um, but I, I too am a big fan of this. In particular, I've got an apartment building that Homeline directly kept uh, Section 8, a project-based project, uh, Section 8 in my, uh, in my ward. And in fact, it's the apartment building that my son now lives in. So I'm really excited about that. Um, Council Member Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to speak in favor of Homeline um, as well, just uh, I think they're a fantastic service. And I, I think the good thing about Homeline with regards to you know, our conversation about <laughs> equity is that you see an organization like Homeline and they're actually not talking equity. I mean, they're doing the work. It's the action that uh, speaks pretty loudly. And so I'm very much in support of this. Thank you, Council Member Yang. Council Member Warsami. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I also would like to add my voice in support of this, um, and I would like to thank uh, Council Member Bender for her hard work and uh, bringing this motion. And uh, I'm also in support of Homeline, and I think they do fantastic work. So thank you again. Council Vice President. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to give a, a little bit of history on this one because I had actually worked with Mr. Streitz on the Homeline issue um, before he left. Um, actually a year before he left. Um, we um, currently fund two organizations that provide um, tenant services. That is legal aid and it is home line. And they are two organizations. There aren't other competing organizations that provide tenant services. What Mr. Streitz did was that he worked with those two organizations to identify how they serve different niches and uh, and figure out what would be a way to that they were complementing each other. I do think that because we don't have a housing director, we kind of had a hole, and this is why it didn't appear in the mayor's proposed budget. We need that housing director to help uh, review along with regulatory services how we are providing the what I would call the right amount of tenant services, um, just kind of throughout the enterprise, including these services from, from Homeline, and also identify a better ongoing funding source. I think there are some ideas floating out there on how this could be incorporated into the budget in future years, but again, we need that um, housing director, I think, to be a part of the negotiation team on determining what are next steps here. Thank you, Council Member Fry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I probably should have removed my name there, but I, I am I'm supportive, very supportive of this motion. I, I think, uh, you know, we've got, I think, over 50% right now of our entire city is renters. Uh, and 
that needs to be acknowledged in some shape or form. Uh, I remember back in 2008 when I was a summer associate at a, at a law firm, uh, I would wake up every single morning and there was Ross, there was sewage in the bathtub. And it, certainly the home line would be someone who I could have called. I, I was a, a budding attorney and still couldn't deal with it myself. Um, so uh, very supportive, thank you. Thank you. Um, all those in favor of the Bender motion regarding home line, please say aye. 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 Opposed. That item carries. We move to the next one, which is Council Member Fry. Uh, if you could uh, talk to your motion regarding Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the the difference between uh, you know talking progressive and acting progressive, and I gave a, a paragraph as to what uh, talking progressive sound like. Well, here's what acting progressive sounds like. We're going to be increasing the affordable housing trust fund by, by $4 million. Uh, we have a very serious problem in our city, which is that opportunity gap. And that opportunity gap in no small part stems from the fact that we have very much so a segregated city. And the way that you desegregate in some ways is that you put affordable housing in middle and upper income areas. Now to get affordable housing in middle and upper income areas, there's two things that you need. One, uh, you need the political will to do so. And I think we have very strong leaders right now on the city council that are willing to take that sometimes not so politically expedient stance. Well, the second thing that you need is, is money because it, it costs a lot of money to purchase parcels in middle and upper income areas as, to as opposed to just throwing all of the affordable housing in let's say North Minneapolis. Uh, this is a motion that takes, I, I guess I can let uh, Ms. Christensen speak for uh, the, the, the budget part, but this is a motion that, that takes um, uh, one and a half million uh, in the CDG, CDBG funding that's currently earmarked for both senior housing initiative uh, and the owner occupied rehab program, puts it into the affordable housing trust fund. That money should be replenished by next September, which I am informed is, a, is around the time that those um, two entities will need funding again. So that's the first thing it does, that's one and a half million. And then the second piece that we're doing is we're taking 2.5 million from the development fund. And while we are not earmarking it specifically for the affordable housing trust fund, what we are doing it is what we are doing is prioritizing it for qualified affordable housing projects. So what that means is that for that two and a half million, if we do not have affordable housing projects that are ready to go, uh, have the proper financing, shovel ready on the docket, it, that money can be used for something else. Uh, but if the affordable housing developers have done their due diligence, they've kept their ear to the grindstone, they've got a project that's ready to rock, uh, we have made the commitment that up to um, that two and a half million figure, it will be funded. Uh, you know, so um, I am happy to answer any questions and I'm sure uh, finance would be willing to, <clears throat> to answer questions as well. Thank you for that. Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I'm dropping the ball. Um, you know, I think I, I'm very committed to the city investing in affordable housing and I think <coughs> Um, it's a really important goal. I, um, I'm happy to see the 1.5 million, um, which was already um, dedicated to affordable housing being able to be used in the affordable housing trust fund. I do have some concerns about the development account being um, shifted into the affordable housing trust fund. I'm generally comfortable with this motion, but um, just generally speaking, this is funding that we use to um, work on redevelopment projects in areas of our city that have market failure. And these are areas of the city that may not make the most sense to put subsidized affordable housing because there is already ample affordable housing uh, available in the neighborhood. And what the neighborhood maybe really needs to help stabilize the community is an injection of resources that help bring the market there to bring in those private investment dollars. These are places like the Kmart site in my ward, which we're working very hard to redevelop. This is places like the Upper Harbor Terminal, like the um, school site in Council Member Cano's ward. Um, these are the funds that we use to, to spur those projects. And they're investments that we typically get back um, funding from those projects. So, I mean, again, I, I think there is there is um, additional dollars in that development account now. Perhaps we need to adopt some policies that better guide 
those funds in the future. Um, so I have a you know a staff direction coming up in, in a later motion here that would ask for more of a comprehensive look at our housing policies. Again, with our housing director, that will be um, more helpful. But um, the other thing is we we spend a lot of our, our affordable housing trust fund money on, on projects that are at 15, 60 percent AMI. Um, and in some parts of the city, again, those are units that are available in the marketplace. So I'm hoping that in the future we can, um, I know it's challenging, but shift some of those dollars to help support people who are in uh, lower income brackets under 30% AMI that are, are really in need. Councilmember Goodman. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm really proud of Councilmember Fry and uh, stand to speak to support his motion today. I think that the mix of sources that he has suggested make the most sense. The development account is an account that is not property tax funded. It's actually when economic development money comes back to us through the sale of property or through the through uh, recycling of purchasing sites and then selling them with an RFP, it goes back into the account. So it's not like this comes out of uh, my constituents' property tax dollars or anybody else's property tax dollars. I'll note that our affordable housing trust fund system has a very specific point rated system. There are many more projects that are suggested than are funded, and those that provide units at 30% of the metro-wide median get top priority. In addition, those projects that are in non-impacted portions of town get many more points than those that are in impacted portions of town, as do projects that are on transit corridors, for example. So um, I think the policy in terms of trying to drive these affordable projects to more affluent neighborhoods and to more low-income people is right on track. Uh, it's unfortunate that the sources of funds we use for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund now have incredible restrictions. CDBG and home funds, you can't have new construction in impacted areas. You have to have only rehab and stabilization in non-impacted areas. So having a, uh, a flexible source of funds would allow us to pick a project in an affluent portion of town and fund it at 30% of the metro-wide median where other sources of funds within this larger fund don't allow us to do that. Um, this is the problem inherently with the fund is we don't have enough flexible money in it and the development account provides that flexible money. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Wright. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and I will uh, not surprisingly echo my support for this. Um, I will comment that, you know, if there's a discussion about uh, lower income amounts or putting it in tougher, more expensive areas to put it in, uh, higher income areas, that just speaks to more money needs to be put in. And perhaps that we can have that exercise next year. Uh, this is a, definitely a good start. Uh, and if, if, uh, if there's a call for uh, lower income folks and in higher income areas, both which just stretches the gap, and this is gap financing money, I'm all for that conversation. But I appreciate this great, great start uh, by my new colleague, Councilmember Fry. Thank you, Councilmember. I, I would like to uh, also echo my support of the. Uh, uh, two parts of this. Uh, one is obviously redirecting uh, revenues within CPED uh, and CDBG and funding currently are earmarked. Uh, and the second part is adding two and a half million dollars. This brings up the total to what we call the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. It comes up to the 10.5 number, uh, which is important. It also reflects the fact that the mayor uh, Two believes this is an important uh, investment to make as uh, an additional million was provided in the, uh, in the mayor's recommended budget. Uh, this does provide some of the additional flexible of uh, free money, not free money, as in it didn't cost us anything, but it's uh, no strings attached that allows some greater flexibility. Um, so I, I'm obviously in support of this motion. Uh, all those in favor of this motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? That item carries, thank you. We're moving to the next item, which is Council Member Bender on number eight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This funding source was eliminated by Council Member Palmasano's earlier motion, so I will not move this one for now and may revisit that. So eight is not on the list at this moment? That's correct. That's handled. So that's not in front of us. So we're going to the next one, which is nine, which is also Council Member Bender and Fry. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this motion is, um, I worked with Councilmember Fry to bring this forward. This is the staff direction that I mentioned earlier, um, which directs staff and CPED to complete an analysis of our existing housing stock and housing needs in Minneapolis to fully inform future policy decisions that support housing options for all levels of income, including the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, our transit-oriented development account, as well as potential policy changes that support housing affordability affordability, including, including inclusionary zoning. Um, this would be in the long range planning department. Um, obviously this would work in close um, partnership with our housing group and, and the rest of CPED. Um, and the intention here again is to bring together the data that we need to set good policies going forward. Thank you. <clears throat> so that motion is in front of us. Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I very much support this motion. I've been talking to council members Bender and Fry about it. I want to point out, though, we have like no staff left in housing. We don't have a director. Now we don't have a finance director. I don't see how we're possibly going to have staff in the housing division be working on something like this when we don't even have the top two people in charge. And I'm scared that we won't even have someone. These two positions aren't going to, even, there's no interviews even until uh, sometime in the beginning of the year, and then it could take 12 weeks to hire someone, and then it could take three months for them to get acclimated. So I'm just a bit concerned about the timeline. I'm just wondering if council members Bender and Fry would be amenable to extending the timeline in light of that. Council member Fry. Uh, actually, to, to that question, I will defer to council member Bender. Uh, while I, in my opinion, I think this is a a smart decision. Um, I certainly was not the driving force behind it. This is uh, Councilmember Bender's brainchild. Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my the motion that I was going to make uh, pr just previous to this would have added an additional FTE and long range planning. And again, um, the thinking that I had was that our long range planning group could do a lot of this upfront um, data crunching and analysis work that would then provide the housing team. Um, with and and as well as frankly our, our policy planners over in development services who would work on something like inclusionary zoning ordinances with the information that they would need to move forward so um it probably is appropriate since i'm not sure i've found the funding for that position to to uh, amend that um june 2015 by to by the end of 2015. so is that a, a change to the uh to your motion then Council yes mr chair i'm happy to make okay. that change so the We'll remove um, the uh, the last sentence that talks about the timing. It'll still report back to the Zoning and Planning Committee, but we'll remove the time reference. Um, so all those in favor of the motion as uh, slightly amended by the author on the floor. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? That item carries. <clears throat> um, I'm going to... Uh, Recognize Councilmember Cano. There's uh, several motions that are all similarly related, if I could. So we're going to go with the first one is a staff direction numbered as 10 in our packet. But if Councilmember Cano would like to uh, alter those motions um, or the order of the, the, the related ones, I'll just recognize Councilmember Cano and see if we can get through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in light of uh, President Obama's most recent executive order on immigration um, and the fact that this is the most significant immigration overhaul that has happened over the last 50 years, I've been working with um, a lot of my colleagues and have been reaching out to a lot of uh, council members to talk about this issue and see what the city can do to be more uh, proactive and responsive um, to what I see as a, as a true investment in the future growth and development of our, of our city with the integration of uh, families and students and community members who are going to become more stable and are going to want to buy homes, are going to want to invest in our neighborhoods, um, who will want to spend more money in our city and who will stabilize um, businesses in, in our <coughs> in our commercial corridors. Uh, so with that, um, I'm co moving forward this motion co-authored uh, with uh, Council Member Glidden and Quincy. And this motion is uh, correct. It is the updated motion. So it's uh, a motion to incorporate into the 2015 mayor's recommended budget a staff direction for the Intergovernmental Relations Department to lead a staff work group to identify opportunities for the city to support the Minneapolis implementation of the Presidential Executive Order on Immigration and bring forward a proposal with a recommended resolution acknowledging the city's commitment to this work. Thank you. 
Are there any questions on this motion? Not seeing any. Um, like to, uh, I just call for a vote on this particular one. All those in favor of motion number 10 by Cano Glidden Quincy, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that item carries. I think that gets to the next as a staff direction, Councilmember Cano. Yes, and similarly uh, along those those lines, um, we see the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department as the department that was established to sort of address um, issues of this type of nature. Uh, so with that, um, the motion is to incorporate into the 2015 Mayor's Recommended Budget a staff direction for the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department to coordinate with communications and other city departments to provide planning, supportive services, and outreach for the implementation of President Obama's Executive Order on Immigration Policy. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any questions on this staff direction? Not seeing any. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That staff direction is adopted. The um, additional one, I think it, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Cano again. This is uh, another uh, motion related to the Immigration Integration Support Project. <clears throat> Yeah, so this was um, a handout that was um, given out by the city clerk staff, and unfortunately, the previous um, discussion on the levy and uh, Councilmember Palmasano's uh, motion took the money um, for this uh, particular initiative, so I won't be bringing that forward. So this one is not on, in before us. Thank you for that clarification. I was a little lost in paperwork on that one. So what is next, <clears throat> Council Member? This is uh, Council Member Andrew Johnson on item number marked as 12 in our packet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This uh, especially deals with our radio systems in the city, uh, in particular Armor, which is the solution used especially for our emergency um, response personnel. It is a wireless analog network is used to communicate. Uh, currently, it's reporting to property services, uh, and this motion would uh, direct city staff, specifically the coordinator's office, to work with the various affected departments and evaluate uh, how we can improve upon this system, especially with uh, new technology and the building now. Um, I actually serve on the Metropolitan Emergency Services Board, and uh, now there's technology available, for instance, to provide data over this wireless analog network. Um, and a lot of data uh, capabilities and software upgrades in the pipeline. And so it's really a great time for our staff to get together and uh, talk about how we can best meet the needs of our city departments and uh, the best reporting structure for the radio lab. Thank you. Any comments or questions on this particular motion? I'd like to point out I'm concerned about the idea of moving it initially, uh, just because I don't want to take a step backward on, on a product or service uh, that serves the enterprise in, in another uh, in multiple departments. But the uh, wording of this particular motion talks about the potential to move the responsibility. So I'm comfortable with that kind of language as long as it's a staff direction that gives us the uh, opportunity to examine it in great detail with the uh, affected departments. That's and, correct, uh, Mr. Chair. It's really a comprehensive conversation around uh, the radio shop, and it is within the uh, jurisdiction of the city coordinator's office to be able to move that at a later time. Um, and I, you know, I was originally looking at just that specific move, but I do think uh, engaging in a larger conversation as well about opportunities on the horizon uh, with this radio system and how it plays into other technologies that we're looking at, like FirstNet. Uh, how um, we can best provide for our emergency uh, services within the city. Thank you. That's for President Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess just my question, has this been vetted with finance and, and um, the coordinator? That's correct. And what, what were their reactions? City coordinator is very supportive and finance has spoken to it in the budget hearings as well and talked with the coordinator's office. Um, and I worked with the coordinator's office specifically on the language. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, 
Not seeing any further questions on this motion. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, Council Member Andrew Johnson staff direction, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That item is carries. Uh, we chug on. Here we are, item number 13 in our packets. Council Member Bender, it's a staff direction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This staff direction speaks to the discussion we've been having about how we fund capital programs for arts. And um, there was some discussion about um, the sort of rollover from previous years and why there wasn't an additional capital um, piece this year. So this directs staff in CPED, who manage our public arts program, to develop a five-year art in public places capital plan. And this would align our arts capital programming more with how we do other capital programming, for example, for transportation projects, where instead of getting um, an allocation each year and then programming those funds, many of which end up in out years, sometimes four or five years out. This would allow the Arts Commission to do solicitations and then request capital funds that align with those um, solicitations and create a five-year budget for those funds over time. Um, so the intention of this in, in the motion would be a report back to uh, CDRS and Ways and Means um, in the spring by March 31st, 2015. Any comments or questions on the staff direction by Bender? Not seeing any, although, oh, I'm sorry. Council Member Reich. Um, thank you, I, I definitely uh, support the, uh, the notion that's behind this motion. Um, I just would suggest now, not as an amendment, but when we develop the report that it may include um, some of the structural issues and how we support the arts program moving forward. Um, uh, just wanted to make that as a footnote as we develop what the report would contain. We don't need to get that far into the weeds at this point because we're requesting a report and I think that's satisfactory at this point. Thank you very much. Council Member Connell. I'm in support of this um, motion. I'm, I'm just curious. So, so currently they don't have a multi-year plan. Um, d does it seem like things just happen from year to year then? Council Member Bender, would you like to talk about? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The CPED has been able to create a status report of their active projects, um, which I'd be happy to forward around. It shows that they have about $190,000 that are not programmed yet, and then many projects that are um, out in future years. Um, my understanding is now we give them an allocation annually, the city does, and then from there, uh, a solicitation is done both internally um, with our city departments as well as externally, uh, and then the funds are committed. So this would kind of reverse that and say, uh, we look for projects and then we do a capital request at the end. Um, to note Council Member Reich's point, I know that he and other council members are working on potential policy changes that might, you know, give a certain percentage dedication to arts. Um, for example, that would give some more consistency as well. Um, but this would just shift how we do the solicitation for arts. Does that clarify your question, Council Member Connell? Ms. Christensen, did you need to add anything to that question? Thank you. All those in favor of the staff direction by Bender, item number 13 on our packet, uh, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? That item carries. Uh, item number 14, Council Member Bender, you have the floor. Mr. Chair, this is actually the same, is a duplicate of what this happened earlier. earlier. It's paperwork, so that goes away. Uh, we have a staff direction by Council Member Yang, item number 15 on this agenda. Council Member Yang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm going to defer to uh, Council Member Warsami. Um, I, you know, from what I understand, uh, it was, it's a joint motion now. And so, Council Member Warsami. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Yang. Um, and this is a motion to, I don't know if you have the copies. Okay, you have the copies. All right. So, it's a motion to incorporate into the 2015 Mayor's Recommendation Budget a staff direction to direct the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department, or NCR, for a one time provision of 55000 for the Minneapolis High Rise Representative Council for Project Lookout as part of their 2015 recommended budget for community engagement activities. And uh, you might be aware that in Ward 6, we have 17 out of the 24 uh, Minneapolis public high rises uh, located in our ward. And it puts a lot of pressure in terms of um, serving these constituents, especially the most vulnerable amongst uh, the people that live in the city of Minneapolis. And Project Lookout has been proven to be a, a wonderful project and we're looking for a one-time um, $55,000 to fill the gap. 
I miss this one time, and uh, we're not looking to support Minneapolis public housing authorities, uh, security needs any longer. Thank you. Um, we have some questions in, in line. This, uh, just so everybody's following along in the paperwork, it's uh, identified as uh, 15 in our packet by Yang, and it's being replaced by the staff direction that doesn't have a number that was passed out earlier with Yang and Warsami, and it ch basically changes the $30,000 to $55,000, if I'm correct. That's correct. As outlined. Uh, Council Member Connell. Mr. Chair, I think you clarified my question. I was just confused about the order of how we were taking up these issues, but you're saying that the joint motion by Yang and Warsame are replacing number 15. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Andrew Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a quick clarifying question, uh, or first a uh, clarifying question. $55,000, where is that coming from within NCR? I thought somebody had mentioned earlier that that was coming from the one Minneapolis fund, which has since been uh, eliminated. Well, the $150,000 increase. Does anyone know? If, uh, if I could uh, speak to what I can here, let's see. Uh, yeah, I it's think within the NCR, NCR will uh, figure that out. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that as well. Yes. Here we are, we're talking about $55,000 and we're not sure about the funding source. Ms. Christensen, can you talk about that? Chair Quincy, council members, the um, property tax motion that was passed uh, eliminated the additional funding for one Minneapolis of $150,000 funded from TIF. There is an existing allocation of general fund resources for one Minneapolis of approximately $62,000. Uh, however, the uh, motion doesn't specify the particular line item from which neighborhood and community relations may um, be able to uh, come up with $55,000. And the, uh, I believe the staff direction is to, as part of their um, outre ongoing outreach activities to uh, focus on this particular um, recipient and provide the uh, requested funding. Um, it's, Mr. Chair? Yes. So I'm pretty supportive of uh, this because I believe it's part of the security and all of that. I know the others who have had their uh, motions before us um, that were impacted by the earlier motion uh, have since tabled them and I'm guessing might reevaluate and consider bringing them back. Um, but I'd be happy to uh, amend this motion that that $55,000 is funded from the uh, $400,000 ongoing for the downtown activation, uh, reducing that total to $345,000. I have a, so we have a, uh, a, 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 an amendment changing the funding source. And so you're, you're suggesting reducing the $400,000 that's correct, in order to fund this particular motion. 55,000? Mm -hmm. Council Member Yang on that amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, it pains me to say this, um, Council Member Johnson, but uh, for myself at least, I mean, we've worked really hard with staff on this and, you know, would like it to stay where it is. Um, you know, um, at, at least on my part, I mean, we've talked to um, Ms. Christensen and the finance departments about this, and you know, it seemed like the appropriate place to come from. And so, um, I, I'm thinking, I'm seeing uh, Councilmember Warsami shaking his head as well, and it just seems like, you know, we weren't anticipating this change. But um, you know, for me at least, you know, from the work that we've done, you know, I think it's much more appropriate to come from NCR. Then I'm happy to withdraw my motion. All right, so we'll take that. Uh, proposed amendment off the list. So we're back to Council Member Yang. Did you have any further converse or comments on the motion? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, briefly, um, you know, Council Member Warsami talked about Project Lookout, and you know, I wanted to point out a few things. Um, it's it's a volunteer resident security program. Uh, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority has 42 high rises, of which Project Lookout is in 29 of them. And Council Member Warsami talks about having over 10 in his uh, ward, Ward 6. I mean, 
from my counts, at least, I mean, we have at least five uh, in Ward 5. And, you know, of these high-rises, over 70% of the elderly and disabled live in these high-rises, and many of them with mental health issues. And so security is, you know, at a premium there. Um, you know, over 200 residents volunteer there, putting in about 64,000 hours a year in those 29 high-rises. And so for myself, you know, I think that, you know, the one-time funding would be appropriate for this. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, certainly, I mean, we want to get them to a point where they can find the funding themselves and they're not asking for it from us. But, I mean, I think this is a good um, project to fund. Councilmember Goodman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't as much want to comment on whether or not we should be funding this, but the source that it should be from. And when I look at the population of public housing residents, renters, seniors, people of color, those that are disabled, it sounds like what NCR is supposed to be doing in the first place. It's kind of what NRP didn't do a good job of, NCR is doing. So whether it has to come out of the remaining unspent funds within NCR under one Minneapolis, or it needs to come out of their direct appropriation, and I understand others are targeting their direct appropriation, and I probably would support that too. Um, this seems to be the population NCR is supposed to be targeting, and so I would urge us to fund it out of NCR, either uh, allow Mr. Rubidor to decide where or direct it um, with the 62,000 remaining balance. Councilmember Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I guess I wasn't clear. Where, what is the source of this money? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I yeah, I just, I just need to know the source of the money before I vote on this. I mean, it, it can't come out of thin air. I, you know, is, is there a money tree somewhere or? Um... Uh, Chair Quincy, uh, Councilmember Connell, the uh, staff direction is not adding money to their budget. It's merely directing the staff and NCR to, to perform a certain function, which in this case is to uh, provide funding for this agency. So they're not getting any additional dollars to um, perform this. So, okay, let me see if I understand what's going on here. I already flipped the page thinking this was going to move faster. Okay, so this is a one-time provision of $55,000 for the Minneapolis High-Rise High Representative Council for Project Outlook. So this is a nonprofit, right? Mm -hmm that's receiving $55,000 from the city of Minneapolis? Presumably. Okay, um, and the source of this money would be, and I don't know if one of the council members who's authoring this staff direction can provide that information. NCR Department of Operations, I would assume. Correct, their uh, current operating budget recommendation for 2015. So when you take money away from um, a particular area, something gets unfunded and something else gets defunded. So if, if we're going to fund $55,000 for this nonprofit to provide these services to the neediest residents in our city, where what is not being funded any longer? That's an excellent question. Um, that would be best answered by the department as they are the responsible party for managing their individual departmental budget. So, Mr. Chair, could we move to table this discussion? I, I don't feel that it's ready. Um, I think there needs to be some, some more reaching out to the department to figure out what the actual impact of this money would be. Yeah, I would uh, be interested in, in doing that. Um, uh, I'm just go, go through a couple more of the uh, comments on this particular item, and then I'll make a closing comment and see if we come to consensus on whether we should carry this over to the tent. Uh, Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I also wanted to ask Ms. Christensen if there were ideas about what would be cut from NCR's budget. It seems to me that I thought the entire amount of the one Minneapolis grant fund this past year, I, did you say that was 60,000? Or, um, Mr. Mr. Chair, Council Member, I think it was 62 in 2013. It might have been 75 in 2014, plus or minus, the one Minneapolis fund. And to the earlier question, it's certainly Mr. Rubidor's discretion as to which particular dollar or not he chooses to deploy to meet this staff direction, whether he uses salary savings for not having all positions or whatever. 
Um, so he would be the appropriate party to talk to how he would accommodate this direction within the set of activities that he's already budgeted to perform. Thank you. Then just a comment. I, I would have felt more comfortable with this motion had we not removed $300,000 from NCR's budget. Thank you for that. Council Member Johnson. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Ms. Christensen, what is Mr. Rubidor's general fund uh, budget? Uh, Chair Quincy, Council President Johnson, the mayor's recommended budget uh, includes the general fund uh, funding of about nine hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. Um, I would just point out that this is um, uh, our public housing authority, the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority their high-rise council, um, and all of us, I think, have high-rises um, in, in our wards. Maybe not all of us, but a lot of us do. Thank you, Council President. Um, I guess I would like to say I, I have a, a concern of, about this uh, as a funding source, especially in light of other uh, restrictions we've just placed on uh, NCR. Uh, so I would like to propose a... Uh, an amendment that would um, go back to the original of $30,000 um, instead of the 55,000 and uh, do so uh, with the one other addition to the, to the motion, um, leaving it to the discretion of the de department um, head who can do these actions under a $50,000 without a, a council action. So um, I'm guessing it's to change, the amendment is to change the amount from 55 to 30. Any comments on that item? Uh, looks like Andrew Johnson was in first, followed by Council Member Yang. Mr. Chair, um, I believe there was a motion to table uh, that was performed by Council Member Cano. Which was I was wondering if we could, a uh, motion to table this uh, motion by Council Member Yang and Warsami. Um, so I was wondering if we could vote on that. Carrying it forward, uh, what I'm hoping to do today, council members, is to finish a, as much as we can here without having to do an additional um, um, uh, markup period, which would be tomorrow. So if we can get through some of these uh, today, we wouldn't have to do that tomorrow and we could take any action on the 10th for outstanding items. So what I'd like to do is to first vote on my um, uh, amendment and then that have that carried forward to be considered to be tabled for the 10th. Uh, Council Member Yang. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm speaking to your, your amendment, is that correct? That's or, right. Okay. Um, you know, for... Let me just get clarification, um, Council Member Quincy, um, with regards to what you're saying. I mean, you're going to make the amendment for thirty thousand dollars, and then for that extra twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars, that's uh, in, within the discretion of Mr. Rubador at NCR. Is that correct? Um, <clears throat> no, the am amendment is to change the amount from fifty-five as a total amount to okay. thirty. Okay. Uh, Council Member Reich, followed by Council Member Warsami. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It seems as though we've had a fair presentation by the authors of this, that they have vetted it with staff, the department head in particular, and have accounted for it, even subject to the current changes that we have through our process today. And I, I, I have a hard time giving this a haircut, given all the talk we've had about helping the people in need in this city. Uh, yes, it's true, it's self-serving. I have several high-rises in my ward. Uh, yes, they serve the people that were described by Councilmember Wasami and Councilmember Yang. And... This is the real deal. This is not only our public housing and the people that we have in need that we care for through housing. We're talking about the public safety component of the housing. I mean, those are two strikes at the core of what we're about. I, I'm going to support the original motion um, by those who supported uh, this and drafted it, uh, the, the sponsors of the motion. Um, I, I won't be giving this a haircut today, and I certainly won't be... Uh, tabling something uh, at this amount of dollars uh, when really you're just we shouldn't be tabling. Let's just vote no if you want to vote no. So that's that's my two cents. Councilor Wurtzami. I totally agree with uh, Councilmember Wright. 
Um, this is about equity. It's about uh, protecting the most vulnerable people of uh, uh, residents of the city of Minneapolis. Um, and again, I think we should put our money where our mouth is. And we've talked a great deal about equity and cutting. And what we're talking about is fifty-five thousand dollars. And I have seventeen high rises in my ward. Seventeen. You know. So again, I would like to vote on the original motion. Okay, Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess the I think the question that still hasn't been answered is: Are we eliminating the one Minneapolis grant funding program this year? Are we cutting an existing NCR staff person? Is this administrative expenses that just is NCR is just has around that they're not using? I, I feel like there hasn't been a lot of clarity to the question that has been asked about the funding source. So um, I don't think that the questions that are being asked. Um, go to the fact that people don't think this is important. Uh, I think this is an important priority, but I wish some, if someone could just answer the question about where the funding might come from. I've asked Mr. Rubidor, but I haven't heard back. Um, okay. That would make me more comfortable. Thank you. We have a, a couple other, other in queue, and I, I'll just, what I'll do is I'll withdraw my amendment, and I'm going to um, ask to uh, move this item forward to uh, the next available uh, council markup or um, council adoption date so we can move off of this topic. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm sorry. I heard back from Mr. Rubidor. He says it would likely come out of the inflationary increase to neighborhoods, which is $100,000, $120,000. So it has a funding funding source? Uh, uh, obviously, that I think this further demonstrates we need a little bit more conversation and some questions on this item. So I'm going to... Uh, Ask the with this move move forward uh, without recommendation, if we will, to the next available adoption date. All those in favor of tabling the motion to that date, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. We're going to go back to the topic of um, the Yang or Sami uh, staff direction for fifty-five thousand dollars. Any additional comments, questions on that? Councilmember Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Lisa, could you vote, could you repeat that information one more time? Where this money is coming from? Councilmember Bender. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I feel bad asking you. You're not even on this motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, I'm probably not the right person to speak to this, but um, Director Rubidor responded to my question, saying that the One Minneapolis Fund now has sixty-two thousand total, um, and so there could be so either that would be the um, source or the inflationary increase to neighborhoods, which is $120,000. So it was my understanding that the inflationary increase was allocated to support neighborhood associations um, due to the cost of living, which goes up. Um, I'm feeling like this still needs to be vetted a little bit more just because there's a lot of questions that come out of that potential move. So I would encourage us to please um, consider this and give the authors more time to clarify the source of this funding and um, the impact on the organization. So my motion is to table it again. I think we just recently what? voted on that. I don't think we need to do that. Uh, Council Borsami. Um, just like uh, Kevin Carpenter uh, highlighted to us uh, is at the discretion of the head of the department and the head of the department is telling us there is money available. So I think we should vote for this. Council Member Goodman. Mr. Chair, out of due respect for the chair, I'm going to make the following amendment. That 30,000 come from the one Minneapolis fund and 25,000 come out of salary savings for whatever salary savings there are in NCR at the end of the year. On that amendment, any discussion? It's been added to our list. All those in favor of the amendment as proposed by Goodman, amending the Yang Warsami uh, staff direction, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That item carries. Thank you. Now we have on the underlying motion as amended. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? No. Okay, that item, roll call please. Council, clerk? There's no need to do a roll call. Oh, I want a roll call. 
I'm Go asking ahead. for a roll call. Council member, or um, Jackie, can you do a roll call for us, please? Council member Glidden. Aye. Gang. Aye. Bender. Aye. Johnson. No. Palmasano. Aye. Reich. Aye. Gordon is absent. Fry. Aye. President Johnson. Aye. Orsani. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Cano. No. Chair Quincy. No. <clears throat> no. There are nine ayes and three nays. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, what is my next item here? I think we're going to go back, if we could, uh, to what was numbered 14 that Council Member Bender withdrew. Um, that was uh, an error in, in withdrawal because this was a budget neutral item. Council Member Bender, can you recognize that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is motion number 14. I apologize for the confusion. Um, this is a budget neutral motion to simply move $70,000 that was proposed to do an assessment of neighborhood activities um, from NCR into the city coordinator's department. Everyone probably knows that NCR is within the city coordinator's department. This just moves it into the overall coordinator's department. Um, I've spoken with the relevant staff about this, and this will enable them to take a more holistic view of both what our own city staff are doing as well as what neighborhood organizations are doing around community engagement for the significant funding that we give annually um, for that purpose. Uh, Council Member Glidden. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just a clarification, because my understanding was the funding for this study was eliminated with the um, with the motion by Councilmember Palmisano. So, with that, I don't understand the purpose of the motion. That's true, Councilmember Connell. That was my same question. I, it was my understanding this money uh, was eliminated with the Palmisano motion. That is my understanding as well. Now that I'm re rechecking that. So we're going to have to withdraw that. Okay, I apologize for the confusion. I will, I will figure that out and, and follow up. Come forward. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Yes. if I might add, this is about the reduction to the convention center fund and my proposal had only removed $100,000 out of it. There's $400,000 remaining. This is the NCR budget. Oh, I'm on the wrong page, sorry. Yeah. Um, we have a uh, next is a staff direction by 16. Paul Masano's number 16. I have a slight change, and the city clerk has the um, the amendments to that motion. The slight change is just in the wording of the word match and to make it a little bit less specific. Um, and that was due to a change after discussing this with police finance. Um, this motion is to amend the 2015 mayor's recommended budget in supporting the Minneapolis Police Department to allocate $75,000 of its recommended 2015 expense appropriation to partner with the city attorney's office with the domestic abuse hotline. Um, I've been privileged to be a able to participate in the sex trafficking work group this past year. That's a hugely collaborative effort that's led by our city attorney, Susan Siegel, um, Council Vice President Glidden, with a number of other departments there at the table. Um, this is something that we used to do uh, as a city, and what it does is it allows police officers to, instead of responding to a domestic through regular means, to actually be able to go and do an immediate follow-up from those that call the domestic abuse hotline. It's a staffing expense. Um, this is a great model, and our domestic violence unit is nationally known for it. Um, the police department is, is comfortable with this. This is a net neutral change. Um, it also has potential to be more effective than ever in addressing domestic violence. It might also reduce consistent resources being used from our police, but more importantly, it, would, it could reduce subsequent crimes. So we're looking to do this for one year and evaluate it. Um, that's my motion. Council Member Glidden. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and to this motion, I actually had a small amendment um, that may be also kind of along the lines that you were proposing, Councilmember Palmasano. 
I had been in conversation with the police department about this as well, and I'm very supportive of this. My understanding is that there may, the police department will do this regardless of the directive. They're very supportive of Councilmember Palmasano's motion. However, they may be able to access funds but beyond their own. And for that reason, I think the wording should say allocate up to $75,000 of their own budget for this initiative, and that would allow the flexibility that they allocate what is needed to um, fund, fund the initiative. Accept that. Good. We're, we're going to, in an effort to move that along, I think that's going to be the amended version that we're going to be, that's in front of us. Any further comments or questions on this staff direction or appropriation? Mm -hmm. Not seeing any. All those in favor of the Palmasano as amended, please say aye. Aye. Opposed. That item carries. Now we're getting to item 17. Councilmember Glidden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. These are two staff directions that I've worked on with uh, Mr. Carpenter and his team in finance that relate to procurement and our supplier diversity initiative. And they would uh, identify two areas of, of research and potential policy recommendations that uh, would then come forward to Committee of the Whole in Ways and Means. One is regarding um, review of single source contracts, and the second is reviewing our existing standards for insurance and bonding for city contractors. And so um, I would um, move this staff direction. Any comments or questions on that staff direction? Not seeing any. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that item is approved. Um, item number 18 in our packet was by Councilmember Gordon, and he asked that it be withdrawn for now, as he's not here. <laughs> so um, item number 19 is up next on my list. It's Councilmember Andrew Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This doesn't actually change any funding for any programs. All it's doing is swapping out uh, the sources from the Consolidated TIF District to the general fund with uh, NCR administration costs. This will give us a chance to uh, more formally address the <coughs> Uh, policy around the Consolidated TIF District and uh, look at whether or not to amend that policy around uses for the Consolidated TIF District. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think we've talked briefly with finance staff. This is just a revenue neutral, changing the labels on a budget. Uh, so we're going to be able to do that without too much questions, not seeing any. All those in favor of that staff direction, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, and that item carries. Where am I at next in my list? Okay, thank you everybody for trying to keep me on board here. We're on Council Member, uh, Council President Barbara Johnson on uh, item number 21 on ZNP. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is just a um, direction, again, to staff, Finance Department staff, and, and I've been talking to them over the weekend. Um, trying to get clarity around um, a discussion that we had in the Zoning Planning Committee, uh, which is that uh, we have uh, additional needs in uh, construction and development code services uh, for uh, inspectors to do the work around the added building that is going on in our community, as well as some of the changes that were made with the um, with Councilmember Palmasano's uh, work on the um, uh, renovation of homes and, and um, uh, changes, and then also uh, Council Member Bender's, um, remind me of the correct accessory dwelling, accessory dwelling unit, thank you, um, accessory dwelling unit uh, changes to the uh, code. So uh, it's just a uh, um, directing finance staff to facilitate the hire of five new positions, and actually they're looking at bell curve staffing, but we want clarity so that uh, those uh, actions do happen. Any questions on Council President Johnson's staff direction? Not seeing any, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, that item carries. Council President, item number 22. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a staff direction to CPED to collaborate with Summit Academy OIC to facilitate participation in the city's job training programs. Um, and Councilmember Goodman has pointed out this is an RFP process, uh, but Summit has not been uh, one of the contractors that we've had involved in our um, uh, adult um, workforce uh, development uh, for a number of years. And 
they have substantially uh, changed their focus to include uh, a construction um, uh, program and then also a, a healthcare initiative that is um, um, working both in evening classes and day classes and having uh, substantial enrollment increases. And so um, we just wanna make sure that they're uh, in the loop as uh, the RFP uh, gets developed. Thank you for that. It's a terrific program and they should certainly be included in that. So I'm supportive of that. Any com comments or questions on that staff direction? Not seeing any. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any other amendments yeah. in our packet? Councilmember Reich. Do you have that one? Go ahead. If you could speak to your motion as you're distributing it. No, it's been distributed. List, I did it uh, as number 23, but. I believe most should have this distributed. Um, it's basically uh, addressing a situation that was of considerable concern for many of the uh, um, creative community that we've been investing in for 30 years, that we would not uh, take a break in that commitment. Um, knowing that there are some uh, budgetary dollars that might be available uh, seemingly, uh, but not necessarily so when you look at the commitments that we have and we wanna continue that work. Uh, the monies that we would be shifting are more future related, uh, marginal reductions in some of the future related marketing materials, both from our other area of arts um, activity, which again goes to the question of how we manage this as a holistic approach when we have two different areas. And then some of the activity from the convention center is actually art related as well. So it would be even though it looks different uh, category it actually would be like for like and how it would be managed because uh, they do have a line item in their marketing that involves a considerable amount of art activity. So it would be a like for like shift. Councilmember Glidden. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to thank Councilmember Reich for being a partner on this um, issue. And um, I think uh, the big loser this year was uh, how do we care for the public art um, and we keep that in the pipeline. How do we care for what we have already uh, put in place? And so this uh, small marker is dedicated to um, conservation and I'll look forward to working with Councilmember Reich and others on how do we ensure that we have the proper investment in the future as well as caring for what we've already put in place. Um, we are a big city that um, has uh, a lot of its reputation tied to art and I think we need to make those um, investments appropriately and responsibly. Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't want to drag this out. I am so grateful. <laughs> this has been brought forward. I met with our arts commissioners and one of the things I had asked about and talked to Councilmember Reich about was using the money this year for conservation of the existing pieces and they were really open to that idea as well. I think this is taking very small amounts of money from other locations, similar kinds of ideas and putting it into something that prioritizes maintaining what we have, along with Council Member Bender's motion to try to figure out how we're gonna look at the five-year plan. I think this is a better resolution than we started with. It's not the ideal, but it is, uh, well, to some, uh, but I do think it's a huge step in the right direction, so thank you. Thank you, any further conversation on this item? Not seeing any. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, that item carries. Are there other amendments floating about that I'm unaware of? Not seeing any, I'd like to return to three staff directions that are on the um, technical amendments and the chair's motion. These are the last three uh, uh, staff directions that we provide each year as we close the markup process. They are to direct finance department uh, on multiple occasions to uh, clean up all the stuff we did and uh, to provide a uh, clean marked up copy. Uh, there's also an additional staff direction related to public works um, to report back to the committee on specific projects for the capital budget paving program. Are there any questions on those three items? I'll move them as a group. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Surprisingly, they carry. I think, Council Vice President Glidden. So, um, Ms. Uh, Councilmember Quincy, uh, I think you were gonna maybe make the underlying motion first, but maybe um, I will just go ahead and say thank you for leading what I think was a very respectful and frankly, I think the fastest, um, amazingly, the fastest budget markup I've ever been part of in, in that uh, scheme also managing an entirely new process that involves 
all the council members so that we all have an opportunity to weigh in on the budget um, before the very last moment. And I think this is a much better and more transparent way to do things. And I wanna thank you for um, ably um, helping us through the process along with um, our great staff. So thank you very much to Mr. Carpenter, Ms. Christensen and the entire team. And thank you again to you. Thank you, Council Vice President. Um, not seeing any additional amendments, I think uh, we are have completed our review and markup of the mayor's proposed 2015 budget. So, so I'm going to move uh, now approval of the proposed 2015 budget as submitted by Mayor Hodges and as amended by the budget subcommittee, and that the entire budget package as amended be forwarded to the full city council for its consideration following a public hearing on Wednesday, December 10th, beginning at 6.05 p.m. Uh, that public hearing will be conducted in this chamber and the full council will take up and act on the budget package as this is a uh, actual city council meeting uh, immediately following the conclusion of that public hearing. All those in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. <coughs> That I, the ayes have it, and the proposed 2015 budget, as amended, has been approved for recommendations to the full city council for final action. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned.